Boston City Council is hereby called to order. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt O'Malley. I am the City Council President Pro Tempore. Um, and today is June 23rd, 2021. We are meeting live in person in the Christopher Ionella Chamber. However, viewers can also watch this council meeting, streaming it on uh, boston.gov slash city council. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor Arroyo. Present. Councilor Baker. Present. Councilor Bach. Present. Councilor Braden. Present. Councilor Campbell. Present. Councilor Edwards. Present. Councilor Sabi George. Present. Councilor Flaherty. Yeah. Councilor Flynn. Yeah. Councilor Mejia. Yeah. Councilor O'Malley. Present. Councilor Wu. Present. And Councilor Baker. Yeah. Present. Present, Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, Councillor Kenzie Bach will introduce our clergy member today, and after the invocation is delivered, Councillor Bach will lead us all in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, our uh, invocation today will be delivered by Amanda Grant Rose, Executive Director at Common Cathedral. Thank you for being with us, Ms. Grant Rose, and Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Councillor O'Malley, uh, and I'm delighted uh, today to introduce Amanda and the ministry that she works on behalf of. Um, Common Cathedral uh, is a ministry to Boston's um, unhoused, and it uh, actually meets every Sunday for church in the Boston Common, um, continue to meet throughout the pandemic, um, but also Amanda um, and uh, her work extends to many of you know about Boston Warm. Um, Councillor Sabi George done a lot of fundraising on their behalf. Um, Boston Warm and Boston Cool and kind of the collective initiative um, to try to make sure that folks who are unhoused have a place to stay and be in community um, really took on an added degree of urgency in the pandemic um, and especially early in the pandemic when everything shut down and we found that there was really no solution for folks who were out on out on the street and in that time I saw Amanda take um, the ministry that uh, that happens in my district at um, Emmanuel Church um, from one day a week to two days to week to three days a week to getting people battery packs for their chargers because there was no longer anywhere to, to charge things to going from providing just breakfast to breakfast and lunch um, to providing critical community beds for people to cool off um, in the middle of the day in the high summer. I just, um, I've, I've often expressed to her uh, that, um, you know, I think they do on a shoestring budget, Common Cathedral, what often we spend, we spend much larger sums of money unsuccessfully um, trying to do. And, and to me, there, there is no picture of God in the midst of the city that is more real than a community um, centered on uh, love and relationship um, between uh, our folks in the city who are you know, my unhoused constituents. Um, so Amanda's an inspiration to me, um, the whole organization is, um, and I'm very grateful that she's agreed to do our benediction today. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Amanda. Thank you. It's an honor and a joy to be with you all today. Thank you for those kind words. I am greeting you from the basement of Emmanuel Church. I have found um, hopefully what is the quietest place to be here, um, but there's good work being done above me and around me. And so if you hear some noises, some bangs, know that Common Art, our open art studio, is right above me um, and good work is being done. But let us continue. It is in tradition and good counsel that the leaders of Boston for generations have returned to the words of the prophet Micah, interpreted by John Winthrop upon the ship Arabella as it approached the shores of New England. John Winthrop wrote, now the only way to avoid shipwreck and to provide for our prosperity is to follow the words of Micah to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together. In this work as one man and one woman, we must entertain each other in brotherly and sisterly affection. We must delight in each other, make other conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, and suffer together. That men and women shall say of succeeding settlements, the Lord make it, like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people upon us. Please join me now in prayer. Dear God, 
loving creator, the eyes of the people are upon us. In this day and in this hour, be our guide that in our work as this council, we may construct a city, a city upon the hill worthy of the gaze of others, wherein we are knit together, work as one man and one woman, and entertain each other in brotherly and in sisterly affection. Whereas we witness in the words of Martin Luther King, the peace which is true justice, wherein we delight in each other, make other conditions our own, God, where we rejoice together, mourn together, labor together, and suffer together. God, within this community, within this city, may the hungry find food, the homeless, my beloved community, the warmth of shelter, the ill, the touch of healing, the lonely, the blessing of common table. God, wherein the hardy are brought low and the lowly are raised up, and the abrasions of racism, class division, and social sexual bigotry are banished. God, who was present, challenging, pressing, when the light of the city was first lit upon a hill, light our path and our city's path in this hour. And all of the people say, Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda Grant Rose, for that inspiring message. Now, invite, if you are able, to please rise uh, as Councillor Bach leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you again. Uh, we are doing our first in-person presentation now, and before I bring up our guest of honor, I wanted to acknowledge another guest of honor, uh, Bridget Walker Edwards, the mother of our own counselor, Lydia Edwards, has joined us. Veteran of the United States Air Force, is that right? Air Force, so thank you for your service to this country and thank you for your service to this city uh, by bringing the, the uh, wonderful Councillor Edwards uh, to all of us. So thank you and welcome. I'd now like to invite Councillor Flaherty and Tom Callahan, a friend to many, to please join me at the dais. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and on behalf of uh, all of us here at the City Council, we're so happy to be able to honor Tom Callahan in the chamber today. Tom has been with the uh, Massachusetts Housing Alliance for 34 years and has been the executive director for 30 years. He's done a fantastic uh, job at Maha. Uh, I had the pleasure of working alongside him to uh, help, uh, along with our colleagues here, to help pass the Community Preservation Act, which to date has raised $92 million to fund 200 projects across our city. So we labored through the pains of sort of the first attempt, came up a little short. Uh, but we're able to go back to the drawing board working alongside uh, so many partners uh, here in the city to get that done. And during Tom's tenure at Mahar, he has led so many community campaigns successfully, including the Soft Second One program, the nation's longest running Community Reinvestment Act mortgage program serving over 23,000 home buyers, also a groundbreaking education based property insurance discount plan for homeowners, a first in the nation matched savings program for first generation home buyers and also expanding state-level CRA coverage to independent mortgage companies. Under Tom's leadership, Maha has opened the Sheridan Hagen's Home Ownership Center, a home for Maha's operations in their civic engagement efforts, and then also has, uh, was the founder, I guess, is the first Taste of Dorchester. That's a signature fundraising event that we're all very familiar with now in its 13th year. He leaves the organization in solid financial standing with a diverse board and staff, both of which uh, majority female and majority persons of color. Maha has also established herself as a leading nonprofit in Massachusetts in reaching low to moderate income home buyers and homeowners. This year it will surpass 40,000 graduates. Maha's home buyer union has developed a mobilization capacity of a thousand or more and employed uh, that many uh, for rallies and community leaders, elected officials and corporate leaders. I just want to take this opportunity on behalf of all of us here in the council and the city to thank Tom for his years of dedication and leadership on the affordable housing issue. Your leadership and effort has made Boston a better city, and we know that whatever the next chapter brings for you, that you will continue to be of service to your community and others above all else. And I know that uh, Tom is here with Simone from Maher and also uh, his wife and daughter. So without further ado, 
uh, want to give a warm welcome and uh, great debt of datitude, uh, gratitude and appreciation for Tom Callahan and his great years of service to our city for affordable housing. Um, thank you, Councillor Flaherty. That was uh, too kind, um, but uh, very appreciated. Um, it's very humbling to be recognized uh, by this, this body, and particularly this group of city councilors. Um, you have led on progressive policies in housing in, in many other areas, um, but we're pleased, Maha has been very really pleased to be a collaborator with all of you on issues that Councilor Flaherty just mentioned, the Community Preservation Act, One Plus Boston, which is the first and best new mortgage program launched in 30 years in this city that is reaching home buyers as we speak. Um, increasing linkage fees, um, our stash first gen program, which is expanding daily, um, thanks to the guidance of Simone uh, Crawford. Uh, affirmatively firm, firm, furthering fair housing uh, guidelines, which uh, has been historic and put Boston in the leadership nationally. So. We are pleased to collaborate with you um, on progressive housing policies, and we thank you. Um, as Councillor Flaherty said, this year we will pass 40,000 graduates um, from our homebuyer and homeowner classes. Our homebuyers union is stronger than ever. Um, our Expand the Pie campaign is continuing to try to increase the resources going to affordable home ownership because, as we all know, it's difficult to buy a house in, in Boston, uh, given affordability concerns. Um, so we appreciate your partnership on all of that. Um, Council Flaherty had really nice things to say about me, but this recognition is really about my colleagues at Maha. Um, our Maha family, our board, our staff, and our volunteers, what really make Maha what it is today. I particularly want to call out Simone Crawford, who's here representing our staff today. Simone, many of you know, is a Mattapan homeowner. has been involved in every aspect of Maha since 2004. Um, and Maha's in really good hands, thanks to Simone and uh, her team, and our team. I guess it's still our team, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, going forward. So um, thank you, Simone. And um, last, uh, but certainly not least, I want to thank my other family, my, 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 my family, um, um, Eileen, my wife, and uh, I have two daughters, Brenna, um, and, who's here today, and Devin, who's in Philadelphia, um, doing some good work down there. And um, they give me the support every day to wake up and keep fighting for justice, keep fighting for um, giving uh, us a chance at narrowing the racial home ownership gap. And um, I thank you. Thank you. Hold on. So, if councillors would uh, like to join us, we'll do a quick picture. Um, okay. we get the middle talk? Yeah, okay. Rose between two sides. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we definitely. It's always been a pleasure working with you. Sometimes we get mostly kind of the same side. I should never have that. That's what I saw it was. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Uh, Indeed. I'm also an alumnus of the Maha's first time home buyer program back in 2006, I think I took it, and it was remarkable. So, and I saved a lot on closing costs, so I tell everyone to uh, <laughs> avail themselves of that great program. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we're now moving on to the first order of the business, which is approval of our minutes, seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter. Um, I uh, move for, suspension, er, for approval of the minutes from the last meeting as presented. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 
Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The meetings, uh, minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Moving on to, uh, to communications from Her Honor, the Mayor. Madam Clerk, would you please read docket 0801. Would you like to read? We're going to read them separately. Sorry, thank you. Sure. Docket 0801, message and order for annual appropriation and tax orders for the FY 2022, filed in the office of the clerk on June 18th, 2021. The chair recognizes the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. Um, as folks know, today we've got the resubmission in from uh, the administration on the budget. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think there are a lot of good things that came out of the hearings that we've held over the last three months that are reflected in this resubmission. Um, you know, everything from more fire coverage for West Roxbury to a doubling of the neighborhood slow streets team so that we can really process the need for safer, slower streets in our um, districts uh, to, you know, a study for municipal broadband. Um, I'm, I should have brought all my notes, but there's, there's quite a lot of things that, frankly, wouldn't be in the docket that's coming into the um, council today if it weren't for all the council's questions and advocacy um, over the last uh, three months. And I've been, I've been proud to be running that process. Um, and I think I've been very clear with folks that I think it's really important um, for the council and the acting mayor and all of us to come together and get a budget for the people of Boston for FY22. Um, I think that that's something that um, our residents expect. I think it's something that um, rating agencies and others looking at Boston and expect, um, and I do see that in my role as being um, the job uh, that's before us. Um, but, and, and I, you know, am a yes on this resubmitted budget in all of its parts. That said, um, I have been hearing a lot of concern from counselors. Obviously, some of it was reflected in the press this morning, um, but over the last few weeks about a sense that the budget may not yet be meeting the moment in terms of the urgent crises of the city. Um, and I'm very mindful of the uniqueness of this moment, bracketing the entire political situation, the uniqueness of a moment in which we are coming back from COVID recovery. We have federal dollars that people will ask us for decades how we spent. Um, and we have crises, whether you're talking about housing, the climate crisis, mass and CAS, um, you know, digital equity, our worries about summer violence, how we get our youth jobs, I mean, um, our main streets, vacancies, how do we get local businesses into them? I mean, these are the things that are coming up and, and it is clear that not all of those things can wait um, for five months and for political campaign. And it, it, it is important to me um, that we figure out how to make sure that this budget is a piece of the solution is, you know, to these critical issues. Um, and so, the way that I feel as your ways and means chair is that if the acting mayor isn't getting us there, that it may be that this council needs to take it into our own hands and think about what is it, what are the supplemental appropriations, what are the things that get this council to an ability to provide the city with an operating budget before the beginning of the fiscal year on 1st of July. Um, and I, you know, the whole, the whole way that our charter works is that the reason that the council president becomes the acting mayor is because the charter, look, the, the, the framers of our charter, we have a number of issues with them, but <laughs> I think one thing that, um, that I do understand about it is they looked at the situation in which your elected mayor uh, is, um, is gone and they say, well, if the elected mayor is gone, where is the democratic authorization of the people of Boston? Where is that lodged? Where can we find that? And it finds it in this room, right? The, like this room, the 13 councillors, including the acting mayor, right, we are the folks who have been elected by the people of Boston to represent them and to fund a budget that serves their interests and meets their urgent needs. Um, and so uh, I really, um, I want to suggest that this council really engage today and over the week ahead with the question of what gets us there, what gets us to a budget that, um, that we can all feel like is meeting that that moment and is and is living up to what we've what we've been elected to do. And personally, I have a lot of um, I have a lot of faith in this body, and I'm proud to represent it in this ways and means capacity. Um, and so, I want us to talk today about like what are those things that feel like we don't have them yet in the budget. And I 
I am, Mr. Pr Madam Chair, going to, um, uh, all of this is a preamble to, I would like to make a motion today to suspend and pass the operating budget. Um, I'm aware that that may not have unanimous consent, that's the, I, as my remarks have noted, um, in, in which case it will continue in committee, but I want us to figure out where we are today and start to lay out a roadmap for where we can get over the coming days. And I want to stress that as your Ways and Means Chair, like I will, I will call uh, working sessions and hearings for Friday, for Monday, for Tuesday. Um, I think that there is an opportunity uh, to think about a, like a supplemental appropriation that might meet some of the concerns of the council. Um, but you know, the way that we deliberate together is in public, um, and I don't think we should let this moment pass um, without without kind of the council taking it into our hands and saying, how are we how are we getting there on behalf of the people of Boston? Um, so that is my. Uh, that is my request to my colleagues today, um, is, to, is to make some remarks now so that we can begin to pull something together. Um, and also, Madam Chair, when people have had a chance to make remarks, I, I would like to move to suspend and pass on docket 0801. And just so folks know, I will also be moving for suspension and passage of docket 0802, um, the BPS budget. So if folks had comments on that, it could be in, the, it could be in a second wave. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Councilor Campbell informed me all I have to do is push the button, right? <laughs> so this is my first time uh, taking the DS. So first of all, thank you, uh, Councilor O'Malley, for this opportunity. And I am going to now call on Councilor O'Malley, uh, so you may speak. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. You are natural. This is like Jeopardy. We're trying out uh, the, next, uh, the next host. Um, well done. Thank you to the Chair of the Committee on Ways and Means for her uh, tenacious approach to this work. Um, while I've been here 11 years, sat through and voted on 11 budgets, you are only my second Ways and Means Chair. Um, and while I have great regard for your predecessor in that spot, uh, former Councilor Mark Siomo, I think he would agree uh, that you've really taken it to a new level in terms of um, not only oversight, but also hearing from one another and really building a communal approach. And that's the most important thing of this budget coming together, finding common ground. We're not going to agree on everything. Lord knows we don't. And we're certainly not going to agree with the acting mayor on everything. But to have an opportunity to come together, put out our ideas, listen to one another, engage with the community is so crucial to what a budget ought to be. As I said, this is my 11th and final budget. I voted yes on budgets in the past. I voted no on budget in the past. Um, this is a, there are some good things in this budget, but there can be more. And we're up against a fiscal deadline the new fiscal year, which begins on July 1st. So it's important that we use this time to try to find ways we can make this better going forward. I anticipate many of you will have issues to say and look forward to hearing it, and I want to keep my comments relatively brief because, as the chair said, we will have an opportunity for a hearing and for working sessions. But suffice it to say, as we talk about what this budget should look like, and there are three parts for those who are watching and those observing. There's, of course, the capital budget, which funds many of our wonderful parks and playgrounds and open space and libraries and, and housing and police and fire stations. Um, then there's the education budget, which we will get to next, although I will say, um, you know, I once again want to underscore that I refuse to abide by this notion that we should be talking about excellence in all Boston public schools or access to all public schools, Boston public schools. Those two notions are not in conflict with one another. And we need to have a budget that refle reflects and respects both, and I believe we can get there. And then the third part of the budget that we're before us right now is the operating budget. So this pays for how the city runs. And it began under former mayor, Marty Walsh. He and his team sort of began assembling it. And then when he left, the acting mayor um, has put her, um, her, her mark on it as well. And again, there are some good things that I see but we haven't gone far enough, and we'll get some more specifics on housing, on public safety, on education, certainly, on small business development, on how we look to come out of this pandemic. And surprisingly, I think when many of us went through last year's budget, there was a real concern that this year's budget would be dire. Um, we've actually seen the economy in Boston be pretty resilient. Well, that's not to suggest that we don't have deep poverty and a deep income inequality. We do. We've also seen, thankfully, with a Democratic president um, and democratically controlled Congress, we've seen some good federal funds as well. So that's part of what we're discussing, and that's one of the reasons why I set up the new COVID committee with Councilor Flaherty as the chair, so we could include that oversight. 
But at the end of the day, as we talk about these issues, I want to keep my remarks focused on the environment. No surprise to many of you and what we ought to be doing as a coastal city. There's some good things that we talk about in sort of broad-based themes in this resubmitted budget, but it doesn't get to the crux of what we need to be focusing on. Heat islands. There was a wonderful article yesterday in the Boston Globe that, that talked about a place in my district. We've talked about all of our districts where we can see we talk about the tree canopy, it's just not because we all love trees and they look good, but they actually serve a real purpose. As it talks about how we pick up trash and collect trash and dispose of trash, that's something that, again, we, we tangentially talk about in this budget, but we need more specifics, we need more plans, we need, need a better course of action to go. The resiliency of a city, a coastal city that has seen enormous floods in the Chairs District and in, in District 2 as well, other waterfront districts, we need to be doing more to make sure that we are a resilient city as we combat climate change. So I am hopeful that in the days and week ahead, we'll be able to have some more serious conversations, put forth some other ideas. You know we are working very uh, strongly on building standards, and that's something that I know the acting mayor is passionate about as well and look forward to partnership there. But there's other things that we can do as an operating mechanism to make sure that we meet this moment on so many issues, but certainly not the least of which on climate change. So I look forward to hearing from my colleagues. I look forward to working together. And again, it's absolutely crucial. I, you know, we've often talked about that um, this, among the most important roles we have our, as members of this body is to be financial stewards of the city of Boston. That is absolutely true. And because of the leadership of the chair and others, we've been able to put forth a referendum in this year's budget, which I hope passed, which will even further that uh, oversight and control and col collaborative approach as it comes to how we write our budgets, how we run our budgets, and how we vote on our budgets. But at the end of the day, this is our, our moment to really make sure that we can work together. And that's another thing. There's always inherently tension between the executive and the legislative branch of any government, certainly of local government. But the fact of the matter is, is I'm the biggest optimist in Boston, and I am very confident that we can work together and work well with the administration. And I'm going to make sure that this body is able to have a seat at that table as well, because we need to work collaboratively. We need to find that common ground. We're not going to agree on everything, but we can certainly make things better. And that's what I'm prepared to work uh, every, every minute of the next week to get there and beyond if necessary. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Look thank forward you. to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you. Um, Councilor Sabi George. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. We often say when we talk about our budget process, we often say that that budget is a value statement. And for it to truly be a value statement of what we hold dear, we need to make sure that we have the opportunity to work on this uh, budget that's before us, and certainly this resubmitted budget. We need to be able to work on it together. And when I look at the resubmitted budget, there are certainly some critical elements that are missing added investment. And as Council President O'Malley mentioned, there are some really great things in, in this budget that is before us. But still a few that I think are critical um, are missing when we think about the added need around housing supports. When we think about the work that is left undone to support our small businesses who are uh, struggling every single day. And when we think about the needs around public health and public safety, for sure. And then the urgent work that is not done yet around the opioid crisis and the opportunity that is before us. And then when we think about our schools, I'm not going to uh, speak again to this uh, as we look at the school's budget, but as our kids return to the classroom full time in September, we know the next crisis before us is a mental health crisis. And we know that 26 of our Boston public schools do not have the full time supports that they need in place to make sure that that adjustment to the classroom is one that is done not just so the child can succeed academically, but that that child has the social and emotional supports in place as they readjust and deal with loss and deal with trauma and deal with the impacts of not just what's happened over this last year and a half, but the uh, impacts of what continues to happen in community and in home. And that we are working towards making sure that we have a library and a librarian in our schools. And that we are working towards making sure that Madison Park Vocational Technical High School has the things in place to make sure that the workforce of tomorrow is prepared and has access to those opportunities. And that we are doing inclusion right in all of our schools. So as we go through this process over the next couple of days and weeks, uh, or week, um, hopefully not weeks, that we are meeting those most urgent needs and that this budget that is before us is truly a statement of what we value as a body and as a city. So I thank you, Madam Chair. 
um, for uh, your work to date and look forward to um, the urgent work that is before us in these next couple of days. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Councillor Saibi George. The chair recognizes the other at-large council from Dorchester, Councillor Julia Mejia. The floor is yours. Thank you, um, Mr. President. So I do have a question, maybe through you, to the, the chair. Um, this is the second time in the last few weeks that we've had motions put on here. You know, usually it's just by a surprise, and so we haven't had a chance to kind of like unpack what this means. I came here already to understand that we were voting on this on the 30th, so now we're voting on it today just to reject it, I'm going to assume. But I just think for those who are following us along, it's really important to note that last year when we had a point of contention between this budget, I'm just curious why as a body we did not exercise this right for democracy. And I'm just curious about what changed between then and now as to why we're able to push for, for this vote here today and why we didn't do it last year. And then I do have some, things, some other things that I'd like to present. But I'm just curious about this process because there are a lot of people who are watching us and trying to figure out what is at play here and how we're able to make decisions the way we're making them and we're missing out on opportunities. Because last year, if I remember, there was a lot of energy around pushing um, the mayor to some of vital police reform issues, but I didn't see that energy from the body to listen to the voices of the people. So I'm just curious in terms of process, if you can help explain to me how in this moment in time is different than last year. And then I have some recommendations. Well, let me, let me uh, answer that through the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, Councilor Bach, you have the floor to respond to Councilor Mejia's uh, query. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and Councillor Mejia. Um, so I think a couple of things to say here. Uh, so there was obviously, there's been considerable reports in the press last night, this morning, about people's uh, reluctance about this budget. Um, as everyone knows, I was uh, Ways and Means Chair for the first time this year. I am the Ways and Means Chair for a second time this year. And, uh, and you know, we all hope that we learn along the way in these roles. Um, and a huge frustration of mine last year was that as you say, there was considerable public pressure, but the public pressure was mainly focused on a no vote because the budget was not adequate, right? And then it was like, okay, and then we got down to the wire and it's like, well, but the problem with a no vote is that you send us to a 112, we lose a lot of things that we care about. Like I said, as a Ways and Means Chair, I have real concerns about losing the AAA rating, about sort of the sense of the financial stability of the city. So that to me is an unacceptable cost. But one of the things that we heard from, um, from advocates and residents was we don't like that kind of false choice. Um, and I, you know, I voted yes on last year's budget. I intend to vote yes on this year's budget. Um, I didn't love the dynamic last year of us being at a place where it was sort of that all or nothing conversation. So to me, reading the papers and where people are and, and knowing that, you know, we're not necessarily on track to a yes, and that I think that in this really vulnerable moment for the city of Boston, we owe it to people to try to get there, and that frankly, this council is ca is capable of that kind of leadership. Um, to me, it's like I don't want to be in the same play a second time. So yes, it's a change from last year. I would say for me, that reflects a learning on my part um, that just waiting right until the day of um, and is not it's not the way to be constructive and for us to move forward together collectively. So I I totally understand the question about what's the difference, and um, and to me, the difference is kind of trying to learn how to how we can collectively do this better. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for that. So I'm gonna continue, Mr. President. Is that cool? Okay. Um, so I, I do appreciate the opportunity for us to really fight for the things that we've been advocating for. So Councillor Bach, I really um, am grateful because we've been hearing from a lot of advocates that we haven't gone far enough around some of the issues around police reform, right? Last year we were screaming for 10%. We came to five this year, and I think that there's still some room for us to push the conversation in that space. Advocates have also have been fighting um, for deep police reform. We, we're, look, we're dealing with a system that has traditionally been, um, there's a lot of racial tension, and I think instead of adding more police officers at this point, we need to fix the system so that we can receive people ready to do the work. 
Um, so I, I am not in support of what is being presented at this moment in terms of those issues. And while I do appreciate um, the 250 that we were able to get for municipal broadband, we actually want municipal broadband. And while we appreciate the study, I don't, just don't think it goes far enough. We ask for more youth jobs. Um, we're not there where we need to be. Um, and I think that if this is going to give us an opportunity to advocate for the things that um, we need, then I'm willing to, to do that work because that's what's going to get us there. And I also think um, the other piece is that the Boston Public Schools, we have schools that don't have HVAC systems. I mean, there's just a lot. Um, and I, I, I think that an opportunity to pause and, and regroup and, and readjust these numbers to fit the realities is exactly what we need to be doing. Um, and so at this point, I'm not ready to um, support the budget as is and look forward to the conversation so that we can get to where we need to be. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. The chair now recognizes the district councilor from East Boston, Councilor Edwards. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I would say for, you know, speaking from the heart, um, while the question wasn't directed towards me and answering what is the biggest difference, I would say leadership. We have that in Councilor Bach. We have that in President Pro Tem, Councilor O'Malley. And their leadership is pushing us to rise to the occasion and try to get to a common ground. I want to thank you for your leadership, Councilor Bach. You have worked the hardest, probably, for this budget and going back and forth with anybody else. So in my criticisms and in my back and forth, I don't want you to think at all any of that is directed towards you or your efforts. I appreciate how much you have done. I would state, quite frankly, you have done more for this budget than the acting mayor has. So that, I would say, is the biggest difference. The mayor last year called consistently, met with every single person, including his would-be opponents, consistently pushing, moving. I had one meeting about the budget, the long list. That's a difference. That's a huge difference. When someone is demonstrating they want to work with you and pushing you. And that is not is what is happening now. So instead, leadership is calling us to rise the occasion. And I do support the idea, and I do invite the acting mayor to pass a counselor's budget, as Councilor Bach noted a budget that is reflective of the real needs and meeting the moment of this time. Budgets are not just about the dollars that they're, that's to be spent. It is about the policy that's to be funded if you truly support it or not. It is also about the moral compass of a city in a crisis. You fund those things that you believe are necessary. You just pass and al allocate small dollars to things that you think are politically nice. But if we are supposed to meet this moment, and if we look back on ourselves 20, 30 years from now and say at this moment, emerging from a pandemic, dealing from uh, the racial, recogni re racial recognizing, uh, reckoning that we've had, dealing with the systemic racism and concerns of the Boston Police Department, if we look back on this moment, our question or my question is, does this budget answer? those things. The housing crisis has just had gasoline thrown on it with this pandemic. Does this budget meet that moment? It doesn't. It does not. I am not comfortable with this budget for many reasons. But again, I want us to have the moral compass that says housing is a human right. That is not reflected in this budget. I want us in our budget to say, that we believe that we will meet people where they are and we will pass a budget that has the digital infrastructure to assure that people of all languages can participate in our procedures and that we're going to build it out so that all access points to the city of Boston, whether it's trying to get a permit, to trying to get a handicap um, sign in front of your house, whatever it is, that there's a digital footprint and access and that people of all languages can use it. 
Our budget doesn't do that. I want this budget to say that we cannot continue the way we're going with the very hardworking and oftentimes the vast majority of good people who work for the Boston Police Department, but there's a systemic problem. There is a systemic problem. And so are we funding a systemic response, one of which a policy myself and my colleagues put forward about an alternative to 911? This budget doesn't reflect that moral call. And then on housing as a human right, you want to talk about being bold? The mayor of Boston in the state of the city proposed a half a billion dollars for housing. Now, I'm not going to sit here, I promise, Councillor Bach, and say, if this budget doesn't have a half billion dollars, I'm not going to vote for it. But I would expect this budget emerging from a crisis would be more than just taking federal dollars and saying, so we have this money, we'll just throw some out at this, at this fire. That's like taking a garden hose to a night alarm fire. I want to see a systemic response to how we house people in Boston. We lost one of the greatest opportunities with Suffolk Downs. We didn't buy it. It went for $22 a square foot. 161 acres, $22 a square foot. The city of Boston should have bought it. 183 in Orleans is a huge building in East Boston, up for auction, down for auction, up for auction, down for auction. And in no way, shape, or form is the city even trying to sit at the table to purchase. I'll give credit where credit's due to Councilor Baker, who said we should be in this game. We should be in this game and purchasing and moving and demanding more. This budget doesn't reflect that. It's not good enough to be okay right now. It's not good enough to be normal right now. It's not good enough. And I, I echo what Councilor Box said. When the mayor is no longer here, then we as the elected collectively should be running, moving, and be guiding the moral compass of this city. The process for this budget wasn't collective, being announced, I think, right before our, our meeting the first budget. The conversations about this budget was not collective. And so I will say this politics aside, I invite for a reset in this conversation about this budget. I invite the acting mayor to be part of passing the council's budget that is reflected of the, of the people who elected us to do this job. And I invite all of us to put the egos aside, political ambitions to the other side, and get this done. But with standards and guidelines that we will not waver from because we are the elected body for this city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. The chair recognizes the district council from Dorchester. Councilor Baker, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Thank you Mr. Chair. Well, well said, Councilor. Um, so I take the budget seriously. I am concerned about our AAA bond rating now. Um, last year, we almost voted the budget down. I think we're in a much different time now. I think last year, we, we could potentially still be in a 112th now if we voted the budget down last year. There were some people that say we'll have it done in July and August or whatever. I'm not convinced of that. Um, and I don't, and I'm very concerned about sending the city of Boston into um, a financial like black hole, not really knowing what's going on. That being said, attaching myself to some of the things, the logic ticket items that seem to be burning all around the city, the one for me is down in Mass and Cass. You know, we, we, I've asked for, through the task force, and, and, and again, I use the word treadmill all the time. I feel like I'm on a treadmill, whether if it's Long Island, whether if it's, what are we doing down there? We need to change up what we're doing because <clears throat> the open drug use, the open drug dealing, I believe we're not doing the people down on Mass and Cass a service. I believe it's the devil at work down there. I believe that. That being said, we need to look at the way our jails are now. Our jails are both half, half empty. Why can't we repurpose one of those as a hospital facility, take in detox beds, take in Section 35s? I know people are scared of a Section 35. I've probably done it more than everybody here in the room. And people that I brought into Section 35, they're not here now, but some of them are. And I think if we have an opportunity for people to be able to they can self-admit in a Section 35 if we had a program, if we turn Nashua Street into just a hospital facility with 
public health, dealing with um, Tompkins, the sheriff, to be able to have, hold people and, and, and deal with them and their housing issues and their mental health issues, on, on, on job training issues and, and GED issues, dealing with them and then getting them back into society after being able to let them get healthy for 30, 45, 60, 90 days. If you're putting people in a detox for 10, 12 days, forget about it. They're on that treadmill. That's what my mother used to say. It's a treadmill of going into detox, coming right out, running into the same sorts of friends. So things that I would advocate for is if we're talking about policing in a different way and how we're going to go after this sort of problem, I would like to see police and fire and EMS and public works and public health under one, one roof, somewhere down around Mass and Cass. I would call it a command center. Maybe that's too militarized. Maybe it's a recovery, whatever it is. But everybody in that room responds to our 311s and in, 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 in San Francisco, they call out the um, homeless encampment, drug addicted, so all of those 311 calls go to a command center. Again, we can call it whatever we want. I know it's all about words these days. I don't normally have the words. We can call it whatever we want, but we need one of those. And we need a real Section 35 program. And drug diversions is another thing we're not talking about. Council Flaherty talked to me about the porch pirates. That's mostly, that whole porch pirates, the people that are stealing all your, all your um, Amazon packages. That's all run by people on drugs that are desperate. We need to put those people in front of judges, and that judge is gonna say, well, you've been shooting poison in your arm for 10 years, so how good is your thought process? Can you take care of yourself? And at that person, I, at that point, I would say, it's the devil at work, and that poison going in their arms is the devil at work, or going in their arms or wherever it's going. That's another section of people that we're not, is just out in the street now. Low-level drug offenses, when they go in front of our judges here in Massachusetts, they're gonna say, we're not putting you away. We're not putting you in a jail sentence. We're gonna give you help, and that's what I think we need to start doing as a city. And another thing, beyond the budget, and there's people in this room that could potentially be the next mayor. What is it that we're gonna do with this Fed money? What are we gonna build for infrastructure? We have a falling down at Frontage Road, falling down, we need infrastructure there. We talk about green jobs till we're blue in the face. What's the real plan for the green jobs? You and I have talked about anaerobic digesters for 10 years now. Is that another treadmill we're on, Mr. Chair? What is the infrastructure we're gonna buy with this? Or are we just gonna take all this Fed money and Dole it out, politically. We need to build things. I have lots in my district that I can tie on to right now, Councilor Edwards, I'm looking at you. I can tie on, let's get 30 million bucks into this lot here and build 60 units and work with Maha and have people buy those units. That's how we're gonna, that's how we're gonna stabilize Fields Corner in places like that. If we're building the properties and we're controlling them, we now sell to who we want to sell to. We tie on with Mahar, and that's how we do it. All those things aren't being spoken to. There's no, it, it's all political here, and I'm very concerned about our city. I think we have major, major opportunities in front of us, and I feel like a little mouse on a treadmill. Quite frankly, I'm sick of it. Um, that being said, still quite undecided on the budget. Would love to see some of these big ticket items. They may come 10 years after I'm dead. I don't know. Long Island's a whole nother thing. If we had a long-term solution, if we had people in a detox for 90 days, that person isn't the most tender person on the street that day. So we don't have to worry about acute care out on Long Island is why we needed the bridge. What happens if someone has a heart attack? They're probably gonna die if we have a bridge there or not, if it's bad enough. But if we don't have our highest need people out there, if we have people that have four, five, six months sobriety, and they're able to go out there and take a take a breath, walk, work on their GED, work on their job training, work on themselves how to become people again. So that's my two cents here today. You know, but take this budget seriously. If we go, it, you know, if we go from a triple A to a double A, what's that happen? Or if we go to a triple A to an A, what's that reaction to us and the banks and the way the financial world looks at the city here? So, 
There's a lot at play. I'm glad we're talking about it. Feels like a family that we're talking about it. So thank you. Indeed. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Chair recognizes the District Councilor from Mattapan. Councilor Campbell, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. I, too, am glad as a family we were talking about it. Um, I made it clear yesterday that I was a no on, on this budget. But I also want to stress that I've been extremely consistent. I was a no on the BPS budget for the last two years. I was no on this budget last year. Um, my record hasn't changed, and frankly, for similar reasons, I'm a no on this budget. And it actually has to do with three particular reasons. Number one is absolutely the policing reform conversation. We had thousands of residents show up here, email us, call us, text us, engage us in ways we had never been engaged before as elected leaders. And that was all, of course, in the response to George Floyd. And we said, how do we, at, in this moment in time, meet the urgency of the moment? And so I was deeply disappointed during this whole process, including with the resubmittal, that it did not rise to the occasion of actually meeting those demands from constituents we heard from then and we continue to hear from. And this budget, particularly when it comes to policing, actually adds more officers. There was absolutely no plan to rein in a ballooning overtime budget, which everyone in this city should absolutely be concerned about, because even the police department agreed it's not sustainable, particularly coming out of COVID. It's a $400 million budget with a $70 million overtime budget that continues to rise. Not sustainable. And I say the same thing for any other department. Boston Public Schools, I'm concerned. And so this budget does not in any meaningful way, and I've been in numerous hearings, of course, including with the police department and other public safety agencies, meet this moment in time. I've been consistent on that. I said it last year. It's the same message this year. And if anything, our acting mayor was one of those no votes last year. So I expected, frankly, an opportunity to negotiate with her along with the administration, particularly on policing reform. I never got an opportunity to negotiate when it came to this resubmittal. That's actually a difference from last year. I didn't always agree with our previous mayor, but there was an opportunity to have the conversation. And I still voted no because I did not see in that budget what I thought would meet the need of the constituents I represented at the time. The second piece is mass and cast. I know Councillor Baker, Councillor Flynn have been working on this tirelessly. It's a section that's currently outside of my district, but of course is the main topic of discussion in the city of Boston because it is the other public health crisis we are dealing with. And it's becoming more of a public safety crisis as well. And one self-in resident recently remarked, in his words, this is a humanitarian crisis because it is that bad in the region. We're seeing an uptick in sexual assaults. We are seeing an uptick in human trafficking, an uptick in the number of tents in the area. And yet, I have sent correspondence to the previous administration, to our acting mayor when she was council president, stressing that we needed a new approach as a collective all working in partnership, we're not all experts, but working in partnership to deal with that issue, along with providers, mental health clinicians, residents who have, of course, been on the forefront with respect to these issues, so many different stakeholders coming together. How many responses have I received to that correspondence? Absolutely none. No response to the emails, no response to the letters, nothing. And when I was reached out to by the administration, I stressed the number one concern that I was frustrated around was mass and cats. And I still thought that maybe there would still be an opportunity to be able to have a deeper conversation with residents on those particular issues. So that is the next reason I've chosen to vote no on this budget. Lastly is Boston Public Schools. And the message is completely consistent. I have always said that this district conti continues in many ways to fail families. I'm a product of BPS. I went to five Boston Public Schools. And I often stress that, but for the grace of God and the education I got in this system, I would not have been successful. We're not going to solve poverty overnight. We're definitely not going to eradicate it overnight. We're not going to reduce trauma in neighborhoods that are grappling with that. We're not suddenly going to bring families back together. We're not going to give youth everything they would need. But this one thing in terms of Boston Public Schools, we can do. And I've been disappointed at the lack of transparency, accountability within the overall system, the lack in terrible family engagement, all of us were on a call yesterday around just how we have to do better on family engagement. We've been saying that for the last six years. And the inequities in the system continue to get worse, not better. And we just lost 2,000 families within Boston Public Schools, the sharpest decline in the last 15 years. 
That should be telling us something. So for me, there still needs to be major work when it comes to Boston Public Schools to ensure that every single student and family in this city has access to incredible education, regardless of the neighborhood they live in or, frankly, their demographic. And this budget doesn't do that. And frankly, with the infusion of the federal dollars we're getting, I still have questions on how this money is going to be used. I absolutely think it should be used for infrastructure. Yes, we, I'm going to be at the Sarah Greenwood School on Friday, or at least a team member. They have asbestos in their building. They've been fighting for years for new infrastructure. These are the projects we need to be accelerating right now, also using it as an opportunity to provide jobs. Climate projects, other projects, yes, build things, create jobs. We can do that in this moment in time, and we can do it through Boston Public Schools. That is not necessarily reflected. And I will say, it, I appreciate the leadership of all of my council colleagues, and I know we come at this from various vantage points. And I do think this is an opportunity for us as a collective to figure out how we move forward to provide a budget that will meet the moment in time we're in, meet the constituents' needs, and do it in such a way that it works in partnership with the administration, with the acting mayor, because it's critically important that we do all work together in this moment in time. And I've been stressing that from the very beginning. I can separate a campaign from doing the work on behalf of my constituents. And it's really important in this moment in time, given the layers of politics, that we absolutely do that. And so I'm looking forward to this renewed opportunity to be able to hopefully get some greater investments, particularly on these three issues, and some restructuring, and some response on issues I've been raising for some time. Um, I continue to be a no. I made it crystal clear yesterday for the same reasons I said last year and years before. Um, and so if anything, I'm excited for the possibility of being able to reset and to have a renewed conversation that will, in fact, use this opportunity to create a budget that will meet the needs of our residents, but most importantly, also meet the needs of our city employees, who also have been stressing they might need greater investments in certain departments. They have major concerns about coming back to work with no flexibility, no hybrid. This is an opportunity for us to also engage in those conversations. Looking forward to it. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Councillor Campbell. Chair now recognizes the District Council from Hyde Park. Councillor Arroyo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you to the Council, frankly, for the passion uh, and the very obvious care for what I believe is the City of Boston. I don't think anybody here uh, who is sitting at one of these chairs isn't thinking about their constituencies, uh, in my instance, my neighborhoods, uh, or the City as a whole, if that's, if that's your charge. Uh, and so, you know, I just want to kind of get into what I see as pretty key differences. Unlike Mr. Chair, this is only my second budget. Uh, and wow, we're <laughs> from the standpoint of having two budgets, uh, this is two completely very different processes uh, thrown right into the deep end. Uh, and what I will just say is uh, I voted no on last year's budget. Uh, and I, I don't recall a single conversation with the mayor of the city at that time. Uh, in fact, I believe that that process was so broken that this council came back with an amendment to change the budget process as it has existed for many, many years because that process was so broken. Uh, one that this mayor, who is currently sitting in that office, signed and I hope gets voted into because it's not does become official without a vote, so I hope that folks who are paying attention do vote for it, that allows the city council to have more say in what that budget process looks like. Uh, but the birth of that was a very broken budget process last year uh, that I don't believe centered the needs of the city. And my asks uh, were pretty consistent. Uh, they're still pretty consistent. I wanted a 10 percent cut uh, and BPD reallocated to specifically services for our communities. Uh, and so I want to get into that. Uh, last year, and I've been clear on this, this isn't news, this isn't the first time I've said it. Last year there was no plan. There was a cut to BPD overtime. I was never presented with a single plan for how to achieve that and make that real uh, at all. And in fact, it wasn't made real. We, we, we've run over that as a city. Uh, and that's, that's pretty true to form. I will say that this year, uh, I did receive something of a plan on that particular part of the budget cut. Uh, and I've made clear to this mayor, and, and if it's you know, moving forward, any mayor, uh, you know, if it doesn't work this year, that particular cut to OT, I mean, hopefully the City Council has some budget process say through this amendment 
uh, but I think we have to look at a different way of how we get to actualizing those things. Um, I will say as well that this year's budget, uh, as far as BPD goes, uh, is smaller uh, by last year's budget, uh, by some amount, not, not a large amount. But if you take out OPAT, which I was proud to be a lead co-sponsor on with uh, Councillor Campbell and Councillor Mejia, if you take out the money allocated for OPAT, you do get very close to 10 percent, uh, which is what I was seeking. Uh, and obviously that's not the end all be all of where we are with police reform. There are other places, the gang database. Uh, City Councilor Edwards brought up the uh, 911 response system that was filed last year and, and wasn't refiled this year. And I do hope to see that we do some action on this body on, in regards to that. Uh, in terms of uh, the budget, uh, I've had a pandemic uh, just like everybody else over the last year uh, that has really devastated my community. Specifically, I represent High Park, Mattapan, Rosendale. If you go look at COVID infection rate uh, th throughout this pandemic, those two neighborhoods were two and three s at different points in time for total. The, the first place being, of course, Councillor Edwards is East Boston in terms of total infections. And so we've really experienced that uh, inequity in, in terms of how it's been, uh, how the impact has impacted our neighborhoods, both from a health perspective, but also from a business perspective. perspective. I have businesses that uh, have really struggled to survive and many have not, uh, and that, that's shared throughout the city. Uh, throughout this pandemic, one of my major concerns as Chair of Public Health was access to testing, access to vaccines, things that I did not believe that the last administration was adequately covering Hyde Park uh, specifically on uh, until about the end of it when we got the vaccine centers through the Y. Uh, this budget creates an allocation that I'm very glad for, that I fought really hard for, for a community health center in Hyde Park. That's, that's a first, they've not had one. Um, those are the kinds of things that I'm weighing. This budget creates uh, some conservation, uh, conservation core money, puts money aside for participatory budgeting. These are good things. These are also things that I will add uh, have been things that have been advocated for by this body. Uh, and so when we talk about the budget as sort of the council's budget or the mayor's budget, this is the city of Boston's budget. And I echo uh, Councillor Baker in that I'm deeply concerned about where we are as a city. We're coming out of a pandemic. We are reopening. I don't have a mask on right now. Neither do, does anybody else at these tables. We are vaccinated. We are in a very different place than we were last year at this time. Uh, and what I would say is, as we reopen, as we try to instill confidence in the economic sector and the faith and guidance of our bond ratings and the faith and guidance of our city as it moves forward and opening up in the way that it needs to, I think that this is a, a situation where we really do need to set aside politics as best as possible, we're all elected officials, to really ensure that we're not putting the city in a position where we could do it real harm in its stability. And I, and I will just say that I think this, this body, uh, through the HRP special election in the middle of a pandemic, the idea of transitioning different mayors showed that they care about that. Uh, and I think that in the terms of how we do this, I'm glad that Councillor Bach, uh, Madam Chair of Ways and Means, who has done excellently, I think, in shepherding two budgets in two very difficult situations uh, through, I, I like that we have a chance to speak on the floor and to speak to this budget. I will say specifically that there are places I've not seen a perfect budget. I'm not sure if folks who have seen more than me have seen a perfect budget. Uh, I have high hopes for the ability for the city council in the future to sort of have more control in that budgeting process through that amendment. So thank you to the leadership of Councillor Edwards on that front. Uh, and I do think that as we move forward, these kinds of conversations are healthy. Uh, if I were to sit here and poll each councillor as to what their issue with this budget is, I wouldn't be shocked if we have 12 different things that people say, I want this, but, but that's fine, or I don't like what you just said was fine, and I want this. That's kind of the process of this legislative body. Uh, but I do think that as we move forward, I appreciate the candor and the uh, passion that I have seen from folks about this budget and about the city. Uh, and I look forward to next week voting on this budget. And I will say that as this budget is constructed currently, I think it is good enough for a yes vote from me. Uh, it is not a perfect budget. It has places where I will be looking for things, uh, specifically on a constituent services level in my district. But I think that this budget has made a lot of progress and I will just be on the record of saying that the process for this budget and how we've gotten here has been much better than the process that I had last year uh, with uh, Mayor Walsh. And so as we're here now uh, under this leadership, uh, I look forward to seeing what we do next week uh, and hearing from the rest of my colleagues who have yet to speak but I, as far as this budget is constructed now, uh, am a yes and hope to see some tweaks in some small areas. But I do think that this budget 
uh, meets the needs of the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes the district council from Austin Brighton. Council Braden, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, many of my colleagues have already spoken to many of the issues that I'm concerned about. Um, you know, we're emerging from the COVID crisis. Um, many of our communities are struggling, our small business communities are struggling. Um, this is an opportunity, this is a moment in which we have to be bold. And uh, given that we are having this influx of federal uh, money that will be coming available and that we'll be able to expend over the next few years, uh, we have a moment to try and really address some of the, the big issues that we uh, all face across our city. And then I will also mention some issues that are important to my community in Alston Brighton. Uh, the climate crisis, as you have already mentioned, is a, is a real and present threat to our city. And we really need to not wait. And, you know, I think there's a sense, there, I really would like to see a greater sense of urgency to really build resilience across our communities, to work on um, our wetlands initiatives and really expand that and go really deep and invest some serious money into addressing our climate resiliency. And that also ties into the need for those green jobs and uh, the training for our young people. Um, you know, our artists, I'm going to swing back to our artist community. All across our city, we're seeing uh, gentrification, we're seeing new, new buildings, new housing, new industry coming in. But so much of it is driving our artist community out of our neighborhoods. Um, uh, Councillor Baker speaks to the pressures on the artist community in his district. Um, in Austin Brighton, every block that gets developed, every, every formerly industrial space that gets developed drives a whole cohort of our artists into a smaller space or they drive them right out of our community. And our creative community are really important to our neighborhoods and really important to our city. So, you know, I'd like to see um, some investment in trying to stabilize the artist community uh, and really uh, see it as a vital asset in our neighborhoods and in our, in our city. Um, the biotech, in the news today, we're hearing about the need for biotech manufacturing. We are building labs all across our city. Those are the, 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 the highly trained specialist scientists and researchers who are developing all these new, um, new, new, uh, new drugs and new treatments, new therapies. But the, all those therapies have to be manufactured. And we, they need workers to do that work. And, and you can get those jobs coming out of high school and do a certificate course to enable you to get adva take advantage of those lab jobs not at the higher research level, but basically the lab, lab technician level. And there's thousands of jobs in the making. Uh, and I feel that it's really important for us not to hang around and wait for that. We, have, as we, ha we had a, 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 resolution, a call for a hearing last week on this issue, but to really be really drive this and be proactive and not go, oh shucks, we missed the boat, here we are and those jobs have gone somewhere else. We have a moment to try and seize that, and I feel that uh, this, in this budget we, we should be bold. Um, in our neighborhood, uh, we are 12 months away from losing a vital facility, the Jackson Mann Community Complex. We have uh, a school for the deaf, an, ec an elementary school, and a community center, our only BCYF cooling center, our only emergency heating center in the neighborhood that shuts down if the AC goes down. You know, once again, we talk about infrastructure. The Jackson Man community, the complex is, a, is an essential piece of our community infrastructure that needs to be replaced in short order. It is a polling place for five precincts. When it closes next year, where are we going to vote? Right. Uh, there's lots of big questions that I really feel in this moment, when there is some extra cash coming into our city, that we should be looking at those, those opportunities and thinking, how can we use these, this ad additional funding to help address some of these underlying issues? Planning and development is a huge issue in our neighborhoods. Uh, some of us are getting ha impacted more than others. East Boston is deeply impacted, South Boston. Alston Brighton at the moment has six million square feet of in under review, six million square feet of development under review. Um, I think uh, Kenzie Bach would probably say that she has a lot of development in her district as well. <laughs> uh, but you know, development has not slowed down. Not one, not one that hasn't even slowed its pace in the middle of COVID. Uh, you know, how will we, we need a budget that will pri prioritize anti-displacement, a budget that will uh, prioritize acquisition opportunities, will mitigate the impacts of speculative investment that is basically coming, people turning up with cash 
and buying family homes in our neighbourhoods so that ordinary families can't even get in the door to, per to live and stay in the neighbourhoods that they grew up in. Uh, we need a community-oriented planning initiative uh, that really looks holistically at what the needs of a community are, our schools, our libraries, our, our transit systems. We build, 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 and we don't think, how are our workers going to get back and forward to work? We need to look at institutional uses of, and our relationship with our big institutions, and we need to try and build in some permanent affordability into our, into our neighbourhoods so that our people who are workers and our Boston residents can live and work and play in our neighbourhoods and stay for the long haul. I think this, this budget uh, is, you know, we have an opportunity and I don't think this budget really meets the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Is there any further discussion on docket 0801? Oh, uh, excuse me, the chair recognizes the district council from South Boston. Councillor Flynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. And Thank you to my colleagues that have previously spoken. I learned a lot from you, and I know each person that spoke is dedicated to this city and to the residents, regardless of um, they're putting their politics aside and they're doing what's in the best interest of the, the people of Boston. So that's a positive, positive development. So I wanted to highlight, highlight that, that issue. But I also wanted to say thank you to Councillor Bach and to Councillor O'Malley for providing strong leadership in this body as well, and especially to Councillor Bach, as chair of the Ways and Means, um, has done excellent work. I was mentioned in one of the news, um, news articles as being um, undecided at this time on the budget. And I'm undecided at this time for, for many reasons, um, including city services, quality of life issues. I like to focus on the nuts and bolts of city government. What impact does city government have on, on residents? Our, our, can our streets and sidewalks be safer for residents, for our seniors, persons with disabilities? What is our pedestrian safety plan, infrastructure plan? Do we have necessary speed humps, stop signs? My, myself and Councillor Baker continue to advocate for a reduction in the speed limit from 25 to 20 with strict enforcement from uh, Boston Public, Boston Police on, on this as well. Uh, resources for youth resources for youth after school um, are also an important part of basic city services. Do we have enough staffing at ISD um, to deal with these Airbnb issues, these late night parties that have taken place across our city? After hours construction as well, ISD plays a critical role in our city. Um, one issue that I've focused on with other councillors here is the Human Rights Commission. I've talked to the mayor and I've talked to my colleagues about that. It was established under Mayor Flynn in 1984. And we've seen over the year the increase in hate crimes. We've seen over the last year increases of assaults against um, immigrants right here in our city, um, especially the AAPI community across greater Boston, across, across the country. I would love to see the Human Rights Commission play a critical role in documenting hate crimes, educating the public about ongoing hate crimes, but also working closely with Boston police and other public safety agencies and with, um, and with the community on how we can prevent hate crimes and anti-racism issues in our city. With that in mind, I continue to study the budget. I want to see what's in the best interest of, of my constituents in District 2. I represent the largest district that has the most residents living in public housing, which I'm proud of. What impact does this budget have on BHA residents? What impact does this budget have on persons with disabilities? What impact does this budget have on the poor, the needy, families that are struggling to stay in our city? 
So I'm going to continue to listen to my colleagues. I'm going to continue to talk with the mayor. But more importantly, I'm going to continue to talk with my constituents about what's important to them and how we keep Boston on a strong path of fiscal stability. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Uh, before we get to the second round, is there anyone who hasn't yet spoken on the budget who would wish to? Okay, the chair recognizes the at-large council from Dorchester. Councillor Mejia, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I am incredibly like in awe of all of my colleagues here today. I am so appreciative of the passion that I saw and I hope that we continue to lead with that fire every year, all day, every day, because that is what our constituents expect of us when they elect us to serve them at all times, not just in times when it's convenient or comfortable to do so. Um, I would like to also just talk a little bit more about some of the things uh, that I think we need to consider in this budget, um, in particular to the Boston Public Schools. Um, what I see, having graduated from the Boston Public Schools and now as a BPS parent, is that we talk a lot about representation, but yet we're not um, pouring our resources into that space. So I think one of the things that I'd like to advocate for, if you're gonna get a yes from me, is ethnic studies in the Boston Public Schools, community hub schools with BPS, um, BTU representation. And I also believe that there are a lot of programs out there, in particular I can think of St. Stephen's, they have a program for parents to develop their leadership skills, and it'll only be $200,000 to help support family engagement. Um, and I think that if we're really serious about family engagement, then we need to actually pour uh, resources that are proven to engage families in ways that are culturally competent. Um, the other piece that I'd like to present is that we've been talking a lot about BRIC and the gang database. And I think that this is an issue that we fought for um, last year, and this is an issue that is still up for discussion this year. And if we're serious about um, police reform, I think that we need to look into uh, what can we do in that space. Um, and then the, the last thing is, is that I feel like this is my second budget, and every year I have a growth mindset, so every year I learn something new, and I hope to just continue to get better, because once you know what you know, the whole idea is that you do better, right? Um, my hope is, is that as we really start thinking about the next wave of conversations, is that we're not putting Band-Aids on bullet wounds, because that is what we do every single day here in the city of Boston. We are resource rich and coordination poor. We have advocates screaming, hooting, hollering, and yelling about the things that they want. And then once a year, we have this grand deal so opportunity to fight for the things that we want. But oftentimes that fight doesn't seem to have a lot of um, will, and I'm hoping that my colleagues this time around really rise up and um, listen to the people that put them in office and fight for the type of budget that we have all been fighting for, or at least some of us have been fighting for since last year. So this is not about politics. I'm, I'm really disappointed about all of these last minute political plays that happen here on this floor. I asked my colleagues to, uh, and some of you all know I don't like surprises. It's always hard for me to process. I need time to really think. Um, so while I appreciate the preparedness of just being able to battle here in front of you all today, I am going to ask my colleagues to be a little bit more thoughtful about how we present things on the floor and give us some time to really think about what is at play. Um, because we have a responsibility to come here prepared to fight for the things that our um, community has been asking for. And I think today's little impromptu, while I really do appreciate it and does give us an opportunity to fight and it gives our advocates an opportunity to prepare themselves for the battle that is ahead. We also have to be super mindful that this is a battle, but the war has yet to be won. And so I'm here for all of it because everybody knows I like a good fight. So let's get it. 
Thank you. The chair recognizes the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, Councillor Bach. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you sincerely to colleagues um, for voicing all of those um, thoughts and, uh, and real goals for the work that we might do together in the next week. Um, I want to uh, say before I make the motion that my intention um, is for us to have a working session. The soonest I can notice one is Friday afternoon. Sorry, but this is the urgent work of the city. Um, the, you know, I think we will, I think that, you know, the hope, for, the hope would be to get the council to a kind of sense of consensus around, like, you know, what's a supplemental appropriation order that could really get us, as Councillor Edwards said, to sort of a council's budget, a, a city of Boston budget um, that we feel comfortable passing. Um, I think there will, I, I was planning to hold the hearing on Monday. I think I'll keep the hearing on Monday because I do think that to Councillor Mejia's point, the public deserves enough notice to know that they can show, that they can get there. Um, and so, uh, you know, we'll do a budget hearing on Monday, but my hope would be that, um, you know, folks come out of this thinking about, okay, those things that I spoke to, what, what really would put them into action in this budget? What can we do that gets us to a funded fiscal year 22 by July 1st, but that, um, you know, and maybe it is some of that federal money on some of those bigger plays. Um, and so I, I'll be reaching out to, um, to counselors to ask you to think about that, but our, as, as Councillor Edwards has frequently noted, unlike the State House, um, we do our work and our deliberation here at the City Council in public. Um, and uh, that's, you know, that's the open meeting law. And so um, I think that if folks can come prepared to work on Friday afternoon, that would be great. I think that we will then talk to the administration on Monday. I will notice a working session for Tuesday as well, just so that we've got all of the time on the table. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and I think there's, there's work to do ahead, but, um, but I think that there's a real opportunity um, for council leadership and collaboration with the administration in order to, um, to, to lead for the city of Boston. Um, and to show what it would look like, I mean, that charter amendment that we unanimously passed, what it, what it would look like for us as a legislature to really step into that role on behalf of the people we represent. Um, so, Mr. Chair, um, so that, Before you, know, you make that, mo are you yes, making the motion? I uh, just, but, uh, I will call on you, but there's one more speaker, I'm sorry, that I neglected. So before you make a motion, uh, that I will get to you after the next okay. speaker, the district council from, yep. district council from uh, Dorchester, Council Baker, the floor is yours. Sorry about that, Mr. Chair. I just want to make a couple more points. So being in 10, 10 years here, this is my 10th budget, and 10 years ago it was about advocating for improvements in, in my district, in my, for lack of a better term, my 10 blocks. Uh, you know, and, 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 and 10 years ago it was Adams Corner Library, it was down a, down a park playground, it was the Hancock Street stairs, it was Garvey Park and McConnell Park and, and, and different libraries advocating for Lower Mills, Fields Corner, Upham's Corner. And 10 years later, I can look back and see how some of that stuff is done. So you lay out your future of asks. Your ask that happens now isn't going to happen next year. My ask took eight years or 10 years. You know, you've been, you've been here. It's 10 years before something comes to fruition. So I'm actually sitting on 10 years worth of, geez, that got done, that got done, that got done. So that's a little bit about how I've worked at advocating in this budget. I want to talk briefly about brick also, because you had talked, I shouldn't, we're not supposed to call people up, but there was a, a comment about brick and we want to reform them. And uh, there's parts of brick that we should be talking about, and I think we got communication on the, on the gang database. But brick stands for Boston Regional Intelligence. It's not Boston Regional Dumb Cops. It's intelligent police officers. It's data collection. It's analyzing trends of what's going on. And I'm really concerned that if we have an eye on getting rid of brick, then we do a disservice to the entire region. I have, I have family that are, that are on Braintree, that are on Quincy, that are on Randolph. There's something that happens in Randolph. It's absolutely collect, connected to some place in Boston or vice versa and a lot of those towns down there. And that's a lot of the work that the brick does, connecting on, connecting on different towns so, so they're not being blindsided. And it's not just gang-related violence. It can be terrorism. It can be anything. Formed around 9-11 when, when law enforcement was widely... Um, criticized for not talking to each other. 
This is our unit that talks to other agencies. So I just wanted to speak to that without, without beating it too much. Chief of Workforce Development is something that's really good for us. We need to be looking at brick and mortar job training also. My, my good colleague talked, talked about brick and mortar job training and also we need to figure out what these jobs are. So those are my last, oh, and my last thing, a lot of people talking about charter amendments and participatory budgeting. I think a little bit different than I think most of my colleagues do here. I'm elected as the representative of District 3 to go after the best, best budget for them. I'm elected to listen to their, to, their, to their needs and what I think is best for them. That being said, if we want to do participatory budgeting, I would say we should do a line item and every council gets a couple hundred grand, however you want to spend it, but you run the participatory budgeting the way you want to run it and spend it in your district, whatever that is. That could be 200000 towards a um, study for a senior housing development or something that you would commit your 200,000 to however, however many years. I'm concerned about bringing the public into our job here. We're elected to do the job. So I think we need to keep the budget within our, our, our power. That's the last I have to say today. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for thank, allowing me. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Uh, the chair recognizes the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Um, and Council, thank you, Councillor O'Malley, and thank you, Councillor Baker, for those comments. They reminded me of two other things I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> one is that uh, I do not labor under the notion, and I don't think that others on this council do, that all of our disagreements with each other as elected officials we are going to settle in order to get to a budget that we can support in a week. I think it's going to be important for us to think, you know, based on the comments that people have made today, and also things that maybe you forgot to say today, but are, as you think on reflection at Councillor Mejia's point, like on your mind, right, where are the places of overlap? Because that's the other thing, is like the, the people of Boston, like yes, they elect each of us, but they also elect us collectively, right? And there's a reason that we have a seven vote threshold is to get to places that we agree. Um, and so I would say like cert certainly in advance of our working session Friday, my office is gonna take on making a kind of matrix of the things that people have raised and starting to think about like what would it look like to take some action on that. And if in the next two days people have other things that come to you or a sort of, you know, when I said this, what I really meant was this feels like what I wanna see share that with my office so that we can share it out with all the counselors and again deliberate about it in public on Friday. Um, but I just wanted to say to, to Councilor Mejia's point that if there are things that come up after the meeting, just like that that's where, that's what we should be doing is pulling them together and discussing. Um, and uh, yeah, and now Councilor O'Malley, um, I would like to make a motion to suspend and pass docket 0801. There's a motion before the body to suspend and pass docket 0801, which is the operating budget. Do I hear a second on that motion? Seconded by Councillor Edwards. So to be clear, what we are, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. This is just whether or not we can indeed vote on the budget, and this is, a, I think, a good indicator to uh, follow that uh, very healthy and spirited debate. Everyone clear on what is before us right now? Not really, so this is just bringing to the floor, allowing us to Allow me to clarify. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, okay, just one second. Councillor Baker had asked, and it sounds like Councillor Mejia may have also sort of echoed Councillor Bach, the floor is yours to explain what this yes. procedural vote yes. is. Yes, allow me. So I think it's important for us to have a sense of, you know, when we're there and when we're not there. And it certainly feels to me that we're not there. Obviously, I think the comments in the room today reflected that. The things that I was reading in the press and hearing from some of you reflected all of that. Um, I think. I think it's important for us to register that that's where we are today because I think that, you know, that sets a starting line for us to run from over the next week. Um, however, I think it's important for us to actually end up with the docket still in committee so that we can have the hearing that the public deserves, that we can have the conversation that's gonna happen in these working sessions and hearings over the next few days. So this is a procedural vote. As Councillor O'Malley alluded to, the, you know, obviously a suspension of the rules is, takes unanimous consent. Um, and so uh, I, I, I would encourage councillors to vote on this procedural motion as though you are voting on the substantive motion today, which is the question of whether or not today you are comfortable passing the operating budget. For all of our conversation, as I've said, like, if, like for me, that's a yes today. Like, the, I think that there's been a lot of things that were put in the resubmission 
that have reflected council conversation and I'm concerned about us, you know, about the future of the fiscal city. So for me, it's going to be a yes. I know that for a lot of folks today, it's a no. Um, and I think that, uh, and that's all right. And that's why we've, that's why we've had this family conversation and that's why we're going to have a, a week ahead of work. But so I am making the procedural motion, um, Mr. Chair, but I, I would ask folks to, to think about it as a way of, of registering on the substantive motion. Okay. I will take one more comment from the district council from Dorchester. Sorry about this. I'm a little slow on the uptake. Um, so, proceed, uh, motion to get it on the on the floor first vote. Correct. And then a no vote. A no vote would would we are still able to get back in. There would be an additional vote next week. Correct. So the vote right now is to whether or not this comes to the floor. If if at least one councillor votes no, and I I am will be a no vote. Uh, on bringing it before the floor, it means we will not vote on it today, but we will, of course, vote on it uh, uh, next Wednesday before the end of the fiscal year. Okay. Okay. So, so. they're voting on to bring this to the floor first. Correct. Okay. Oh, no. But uh, I'm sorry. The chair recognizes the at-large council from Dorchester. Council from here. Want to help us understand this? So what? Are, what are we? What are we voting on? On the budget? Yes or no? Is that We're voting to allow discussion of the budget in suspension of the rules. As so that we would all be a yes, right? So we're voting yes to be able to do that. And then what are we voting no to? Like I don't. No, I mean I, I would argue that we should not suspend the rules. Uh, this is this is unorthodox. Apologies for speaking from the dais, but. I would argue that we not suspend the rules to vote on the budget today because it was just received today. And I am hopeful that through a, an extended process of a working session Friday, hearing Monday, possibly hearing Tuesday, we'll be able to have a better thing, better, better product before us when we do vote next Wednesday. Is that helpful? Can, no. Can I? Okay. Can I? Mr. Chairman. Just not chair, helpful at all. May chair I? recognizes the uh, uh, chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, Councillor Bach. Councilor Mejia, I, I guess the way to think about it is if everybody in this room were ready to pass the operating budget, then they would vote to suspend the rules, right, and then vote to pass the budget. Um, I, I don't expect people to be there, obviously. Um, I think that uh, I, I'm trying to offer this procedural vote as a proxy for registering where people are right now today on the budget. So if you're not, if you're not ready today to pass the mayor's operating budget, then I would vote no on this. For me, if it were just me, like I, you know, I think that there's a lot of things that, uh, that are of concern and, and as, a, as the Ways and Means Chair, I want us to get to yes collectively in this way that I think we're gonna work in the week ahead. Um, but, you know, I, I want us to get to yes, so I'll vote yes today, um, but I, you know, that's the, the, the goal is really to show, the goal is to make it clear where we, where we are. Okay, so. Uh, Can I speak to that? You know, well, we will get, we will get, and then I, we're gonna get one more round and then we're moving, I'm calling the question. The chair recognizes the district council from Hyde Park, Council Royal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just have uh, just two clarifying questions. So essentially, this is a vote to suspend and pass. If I, as the first vote, say no because you've already said that you're going to say no does the vote stop here or do we just do the whole no, we'll thing continue the vote of all councillors okay thank you thank you chair thank you for being for brevity too councillor royal chair recognizes the district council from east boston councillor edwards um i i i was clear until this uh, about what we were doing so thank you uh for pushing back i i thought i understood um so just a quick breakdown of my understanding the motion is to suspend and pass. Correct. Right, okay. So we're then bringing the budget forward, and if you are voting yes, you are agreeing that we should spend the rules and pass the budget. And if you vote no, you are saying we should not. That is correct. Okay? All right, good. Thank you. Making sure. Chair recognizes the district council for Mattapan, Councilor Campbell. I, I, I wanna, I think we need to take a step back. I think the first request is if we are going to suspend the rules as a body Correct. to then take that vote. If Correct. one counselor objects to the suspension of that rules, it then cancels everything. Correct. You don't have to call on every counselor because we've done it in the past. Only one counselor has to object, and if one objects, then it goes to committee, and it solves that. You don't need a vote of all counselors once one person objects. So I would urge you, Mr. President, to, if there was a motion on the floor to suspend the rules, someone seconded it. If one person objects and any counselor can voice that, it squashes it and then we move on. All counselors I, I, would not take a vote on it because it would be mute at that, moot at that point. 
Certainly. Um, it is the discretion of the chair, as you know. You, you did it so well for so I don't for think many so. long. But well, I'm going to do a, a roll call vote uh, on this motion before us. And I would say, I would disagree. I think in the rules it's crystal clear. Only one counselor has to object, and that's it. No, Councillor Roy, I think I've already voiced that. Okay. The chair recognizes, thank you, Councillor Campbell. The chair recognizes the at large counsel from South Boston, Councillor Flaherty. The thank floor you, is Mr. yours. President, just to, through, to, from the previous speaker, maybe just an offer of a compromise is that we do a voice vote. All in favor say aye, I'll post, they know, and then we'll sort of get an indication as to who's aye, who's they, and that'll probably trigger the uh, previous speaker's comment that there'd be a nay, you'd hear a nay, which would then suspend, obviously, would, would prevent the suspension. Now, I, I appreciate that. It is my, uh, it is uh, the opinion of the chair that he or she can call a roll call vote if, if needed on any motion, uh, which is what I would proceed to do out of a, a deference of collaboration. I, I guess I would defer to the clerk, who also served uh, admirably as the council president. Uh, Madam Clerk, on a motion, can the chair compel a roll call vote? I believe on a motion. Could. Okay. In, in normal circumstance, you would have just someone objecting, and it would be. But I think this is a unique motion in that it is something that's just arrived today, and um, what they're looking for is to get temperature. That's right. Okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Ch uh, Chair recognizes the at-large council from South Boston, Councilor Thank you, Mr. President, and point of order. And then, obviously, at the end of the voice vote, someone could doubt the vote, and then you, as the chair, would get the roll call. Thank you. So there's two ways to get there. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. President Emeritus. Chair recognizes Councilor Royal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I would just say this, the suspend and pass is always done on the moment. It, it, there's nothing unique about this suspend and pass comparatively to any other suspend and pass on a resolution or a motion. They all come to the floor the same exact way. So I don't know what the uniqueness here would be. Uh, I, I'm going to object because it's very clear that the rest of the body objects. I don't think we need to take all of this time to get to an objection. That's, 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 my, that's my overarching point. I would ask the uh, chair to, to try and to save some time there with that. Thank you, Councilor Royal. I am now calling the question before us. There is a motion before the body offered by Ken Councillor Kenzie Bach, the Chair of the Committee on Ways and Means. It has been seconded by Councillor Edwards. The motion is to suspend the rules and pass docket 0801. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. 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 The vote. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll on, doc on the uh, motion before us. Thank you, Mr. President. On docket 0801, suspension and passage, Councilor Arroyo. No. Councilor Arroyo, no. Councilor Baker. No. Councilor Baker, no. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. No. Councilor Braden, no. Councilor Campbell. No. Councilor Campbell, no. Councilor Edwards. No. Councilor Edwards, no. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. No. Councilor Flaherty, no. Council Flynn, no. Council Flynn, no. Council J. Council, I'm so sorry. No. Council Mejia, no. Council Mejia, no. Council O'Malley, no. Council O'Malley, no. And Council Wu, no. Council Wu, no. Mr. President, uh, the motion has been. Thank you, Madam Clerk, and thank you, colleagues. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you now <laughs> move on to docket 0802? Docket 0802, message and order for an annual appropriation for the school department for FY 2022, filed in the office of the clerk on June 18, 2021. And I'm sorry, Madam Clerk, I neglected docket 0801 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. That was the last thing we just had. Thank you uh, to our great central staff director. So Lady Valdez, um, and now docket 0802, the chair recognizes the uh, chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, Councillor Bach, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I just want to, I know that a number of councillors already commented on the BPS budget. Um, I did want to create an opportunity for councillors to, to comment on it who didn't. Um, and, you know, I'll just say, obviously, the BPS budget uh, reflects um, 
some considerable additional staffing in terms of social workers across the um, district and a number of other things that we've discussed in 10 or so hearings. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I will recognize uh, <laughs> getting played off here. Celestial uh, choirs are, are now <laughs> participating. Um, yeah, obviously, since the council, as was just demonstrated, doesn't really want to take a procedural vote as a substantive vote, I won't, I, I won't uh, insist on that for the, for the uh, BPS budget. Um, I'll, I'll technically make a motion to suspend and pass just to give people the space to make a comment, Mr. Chair. But after that, if, in, if you think it's better off referred to committee, I'm happy to defer to you on it. Okay, thank you. Is there any further discussion on 0802? Uh, seeing and hearing none, um, are you making a motion, Councillor Bach? No, it's fine. Just send it to committee. Okay. Docket 0802 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Madam Clerk, please read Docket 0803 through 0805. Docket 0803, message and order approving the appropriation of $40 million to the other post-employment benefits known as OPEB Liability Trust Fund, established under Section 20 of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 32B, filed in the Office of the Clerk on June 18, 2021. Docket number 0804, message and order approving an appropriation of $12,600,000 from the City's Capital Grant Fund in order to provide funding for various transportation and public realm improvements. These projects are aligned with the goals of the Go Boston 2030, the city's transportation master plan. The funds shall be credited from the capital grant fund from the parking meter fund. Filed in the office of the city clerk on June 18, 2021. Docket number 0805, message and order approving an appropriation of $2 million from the city's capital grant fund to address the impact of transportation network services on municipal roads, bridges, and other transportation infrastructure, or any other public purpose substantially related to the operation of transportation network services in the city. Such funds shall be transferred and credited to the capital grant fund from revenue received from the Commonwealth Transportation Infrastructure Enhancement Trust Fund, filed in the office of the clerk on June 18, 2021. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, the uh, docket 0803 through 0805 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Madam Clerk, would you please read docket 0806 through 0808. Thank you. Docket number 0806, message and order authorizing the appropriation of $1,300,000 from the income of the John I'm sorry, George Francis Parkman Fund. The funds are to be expended under the direction of the Commissioner of Parks and Recreation for the maintenance and improvement of Boston Common and parks in existence since January 12, 1887. Docket number 0807, message and order approving, approving $4,400,000 from the 21st Century Fund, also known as the Public Educational and Governmental PEG Access and Cable Related Fund pursuant to Section 53F and three quarters of Chapter 44 of the General Laws to the PEG Access and Cable Related Grant for Cable Related Purposes consistent with the franchise agreement between the cable operator and the city, including but not limited to, one, supporting public educational and governmental access cable television service, Two, monitoring compliance of cable operator with the franchise agreement. Or three, preparation of renewal of the franchise license. And docket number 0808, message and order approving the appropriation of $500,000 from the City of Boston's equity fund to create a special revenue project grant in order to support equity applicants and licensees as defined by the equity program and to establish and operate a cannabis business in the city of Boston. The fund shall be credited to the special revenue grant fund from the city of Boston's equity fund established pursuant to the city of Boston's ordinance, chapter eight, section 13, establishing the equitable regulations of the cannabis industry in the city of Boston. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The Chair recognizes Councillor Kenzie Bach, Chair of the Committee on Ways and Means. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Here, I'm actually uh, going to be asking for council suspension and passage, hoping um, for support. Um, I uh, mentioned at our meeting on June 9th that um, for these three funds, they're all funds where we get in the money to a tr trust fund that can only be used for a very specific dedicated purpose. Um, and then what we do is appropriation orders to actually, like, actually send that money out the door. Um, and I would have moved for their passage along with the revolving funds on June 9th, except that we didn't yet have from the administration some of the info about the fund balances um, that I felt it was you know, necessary for the council to have in order to responsibly appropriate out of these funds. Um, we have since received that. It's been circulated to councilors. Um, all three of these funds, the Parkman, um, is a, it, that fund's actually invested, and we have an investment policy of always like, spending no more than 5% um, of, uh, of the current fund, and so this is on track with that, and we use it for our parks and cemeteries and such. Um, the, the PEG Access Fund, we had a great do-it hearing um, where we talked to both BNN and um, the uh, Tech Goes Home groups that do amazing work with these funds. Um, and again, that, this is a consistent appropriation that we've done year after year. Um, and the equity fund is, as folks know, a new fund coming out of cannabis um, that's designed to really support our uh, cannabis entrepreneurs. So because these are funds that we would not, in a broader budget conversation, redirect um, because they really are for this dedicated purpose and they just need the appropriation order from the council. And since um, we've received the kind of background information um, it makes me comfortable recommending it as chair. Um, I know, Mr. President, that we need to vote on each of these separately, but I would motion to suspend and pass docket 08, 06, 07, and 08. Thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair. Any further discussion on these dockets? Um, Trish, do you want to call the roll? <laughs> Oh, there she is. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, we are now uh, Councillor Bach, Chair of the Committee of Ways and Means, seek suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0806. All those in, f does this need to be a roll call, Madam Clerk, or can this be voice vote? Okay. Roll call. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll on Docket 06, uh, excuse me, 0806. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, one and all. <laughs> uh, on Docket 0806, Councillor Arroyo. Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker. Aye. Council Baker, aye. Council Bach. Aye. Council Bach, aye. Council Braden. Aye. Council Braden, aye. Council Campbell. Yes. Council Campbell, yes. Council Edwards. Yes. Council Edwards, yes. Council Savvy George. Yes. Council Savvy George, yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Mejia. Council Mejia, yes. Council O'Malley. Yes. Council O'Malley, yes. And Council Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Mr. President, document number 0806 is passed unanimously. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, the chair also calls for suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0807. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you. Docket number 0807 for suspension and passage. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach. Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Campbell. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. President, docket number 0807 has passed unanimously. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Chair of the Committee on Ways and Means seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0808. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you. Passage of docket 0808. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach. Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Councillor Campbell, yes. Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards, yes. Councillor Sabi George. Yes. Councillor Sabi George, yes. Councillor Flaherty. Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Flynn. Yes. Councillor Flynn, yes. Councillor Mejia. Yes. Councillor Mejia, yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor O'Malley, yes. And Councillor Wu. Yes. Councillor Wu, yes. Mr. President, docket number 0808 has passed unanimously. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Would you now please read docket 0809 and 0810 together? Thank you. Docket 0809, message and order approving an appropriation order in the amount of 1 million, I'm sorry, 91 million, 
$270,000 for the purpose of paying costs of design and construction, equipping and furnishing a new building for the William E. Carter School that is to be built on the site of the current location at 396 Northampton Street in the City of Boston, including the payment of all incidental or related thereto, and for which the City of Boston may be eligible for a grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority known as MSBA. Said amount to be expended under the direction of the Public Facilities Department on behalf of the Boston Public Schools. And docket number 0810, message and order, authorizes the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $55 million in the form of a grant awarded by the United States Department of Treasury to be administered by the City of Boston's Chief Financial Officer, Collector Treasurer. This grant payment is made from the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund, known as the CLFRF in the Treasury of the United States, established by Section 9901 of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, known as ARPA. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 08 and 0809 and 0810 shall be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Madam Clerk, please read Docket 0811. Thank you. Docket 0811, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $480,000 in the form of a grant awarded by the Boston CHNA CHIP Collaborative to be administered by the Office of HHS. This grant will fund a citywide community health needs assessment, which is CHNA, and a community health improvement plan known as CHIP process. Docket 0811 will be referred to the Committee on Public Health. Madam Clerk, would you please read Docket 0812 through 0814. Thank you. Docket 0812, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expand an amount of $239,000 in the form of a grant for the 2021 Transportation Construction Grant awarded by the Massachusetts Gaming Commission to be administered by the Transportation Department. The grant will fund the Lost Village project in the Charlestown, in the, in the Charlestown neighborhood. Docket number 0813, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept an amount of $200,000 in the form of a grant for the 2021 Transportation Planning Grant awarded by the Massachusetts Gaming Commission to be, to be the Transpo Transportation Department. The grant will fund a portion of the design and cost under the Tetra Tech contract for the Sullivan Square Rutherford Avenue project. And docket number 0814, message and order for your approval. An order authorizing the City of Boston Conservation Commission to receive a property located at Morrison Street, unnumbered, in the Rosendale neighborhood of Boston and identified by the City of Boston Assessing Department, parcel identification number 2005165000 known as the property. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 0812, 0813, and 0814 shall be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Moving on to reports of public officers and others. Docket number 0815, notices received from the acting mayor of the reappointment of Betty Francisco as a member of the Boston School Committee nominating panel. Thank you. Docket 0815 will be placed on file. Moving on to matters recently heard for possible action. Madam Clerk, would you please begin with Docket 0685. Docket 0685, an order regarding a text amendment to the Boston Zoning Code with respect to the parking minimums for affordable housing. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councillor Lydia Edwards, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Chair Edwards, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And again, I would like to thank the sponsors of that matter, um, yourself and uh, Councillor Bach. Uh, we had a, a very, I think, great conversation, honestly, about the what the change would mean, the impact on affordable housing, and why, honestly, we as a city need to make, to a certain extent, a decision on how we're going to um, and how we're going to zone, and how we're going to house people. I want to thank the, uh, my colleagues who came to that hearing. I think it was well attended. Councillor Wu, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Baker, Councillor Brady, <coughs> Councillor Royo, Councillor Mejia, who all came and spoke specifically about parking and housing. 
Um, I also want to thank the many advocates who showed up as well, who also had, I think, great opinions and thoughts. For now, I think I'd like to keep this zoning amendment in committee uh, while we work on some of the language and making sure we're very clear of the impacts and also allow for more of the public to come and talk about those impacts at uh, 10 o'clock. We were doing this because of the fact that we were trying to get this done during budget season, but I think we all agreed we'd love to hear more from the public. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Uh, docket 0685 will remain in the Committee on Government Operations. Moving right along to motions, orders, and resolutions. Madam Clerk, would you please read Docket 0816. Certainly. Docket 0816, Councilors Flynn and Campbell offer the following order for hearing on domestic violence and sexual assaults in the City of Boston. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The Chair recognizes the District Council from South Boston. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, um, I'm glad to partner again with Councilor Campbell on this important hearing. We've partnered on it in the past several times. We recently had a hearing on domestic violence. We worked with Northeastern University Law School. We had an excellent hearing, city council hearing, at that site with survivors, with domestic violence um, educators and providers, and uh, the community as well. Um, domestic violence and sexual assaults um, continue today, but especially during this pandemic. We have seen a lot of people that have been working from home, um, being with their spouse or being with their, with their partner, um, be a victim of domestic violence. And oftentimes it's very difficult for the victim to get the necessary help and services. Um, some states, such as Massachusetts, one in two women are a victim of domestic violence or sexual assaults, and even men are victims, uh, one in four men are a victim of domestic assaults as well. Um, so it's important we continue this conversation to make sure we let survivors know that there are services available to them, including services in many languages, including services that um, are for immigrant communities, I do some work with the Asian Task Force Against Domestic Violence, and when I met with the director, and I continue to meet with the executive director, um, I always ask her what her number one challenge is, and she always tells me it's language access, making sure that someone that's a victim of domestic violence, when they come to their facility to seek services, that they're able to partner with them, so that victim does have the um, ability to communicate back and forth. That's their number one challenge, is language access. And also, myself and Councillor Campbell have also talked with survivors that have difficulty getting the necessary housing services as well. So we're going to hopefully use this opportunity as an, as, as an opportunity to let survivors know about services that are available and to continue to advocate for funding that increases domestic violence uh, services throughout our city. Again, want to say thank you to Councillor Campbell. Want to say thank you to all of my colleagues, and um, also to the the partners that we've communicated with in the past and that we'll continue to work with. I want to say thank you for their tremendous leadership on this very difficult issue. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Councillor Flynn. The Chair now recognizes the District Council from Mattapan. Councillor uh, Campbell, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Councillor Flynn, for the continued partnership on this issue. I also want to thank and um, continue to thank uh, Northeastern Law School, their domestic violence clinic, where we held our powerful hearing now, I guess, a couple of years ago, um, where they've been doing the work in, in an intersectional way and intimately with a whole range of providers um, they've been a great partner to both of us, particularly during COVID, where there has been an uptick in cases where we have a place to go to help folks get resources and even creative solutions. If you're obviously living with your abuser, it's difficult to report. They've developed technology and all kinds of incredible tools in the midst of COVID for folks to get help and resources. So I want to thank them and Margo, who, who leads that uh, institute. I also want to thank all the providers. And we've held other hearings, I know Councilor Braden and others, on just how difficult it's been to do this work in the midst of the pandemic. 
how these providers are doing everything with very limited resources, limited human capital as these cases go up. And we're seeing an uptick not only in domestic violence, sexual assault, obviously we talked about mass and CAS earlier, um, major concerns there. And I will also add they do work around child abuse. And it was really important to me to talk about the intersectionality of all of those issues. And there are specific pro providers who do work in this space who appreciated our intentionality on this issue and connecting all of these uh, all of these issues because child abuse is often not talked about and it's a major component of, of these, cons uh, these types of cases. So I want to thank the providers for the work they do. I also want to thank the providers not only for the work they've done in COVID, but their intersectionality in lifting up the fact that the cases with respect to our LGBTQ plus community, immigrant community are often unreported or they just don't have any data whatsoever. So this hearing was designed to really center the providers, but most importantly, the survivors. And in our hearing at Northeastern, we were blessed to actually have survivors come forward in a public way and share their stories on the, ver the first panel to introduce the conversation. Uh, and it was powerful. And we had a range of folks subsequent to that who identify as someone in the LGBTQ plus community or in other communities, immigrant communities, also come forward and share stories with us. So this is an opportunity to have another hearing to talk about how we continue to invest in these innovative tools how we continue to do better with respect to collection of da data, transparency around data, um, how we do better with just coordinating across so many different players, not only to make sure folks have access to resources, can easily report, but also have access to housing, which continues to be a major concern, have access to workforce development opportunities, mental health supports. We talk about homelessness. The provider spoke to how domestic violence is a lead cause of homelessness, the intersectionality of those issues. So we learned a great deal, and there's still more work to do, and this is the time to do it. So again, Councilor Flynn, thank you for the partnership. Thank you to, to the providers who are doing the work every single day, and to the survivors who push us to center them in this work, who also push us to acknowledge that the solutions we put forward would be ineffective if they weren't at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. The chair recognizes the at-large counsel from Dorchester, Councillor Saibi George. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And if uh, the clerk would please add my name in. I commend the makers on this effort. This work is certainly critically important, and there's a certain urgency to it. I would ask that we add, as a guest, health care for the homeless, as they do a critical amount of outreach when we think about women um, and uh, those that are uh, unfortunately dealing with sexual assault and sexual violence, um, who are unfortunately also participating often in survival sex, that they uh, be included for their work and their continued um, efforts to provide resources and support and care uh, for women who are uh, dealing with this and who are often also dealing with substance use disorder and um, homelessness. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Saibi George. Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Saibi George as a co sponsor. The Chair recognizes the at large council from South Boston. Councillor Flaherty, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, please add my name and just want to thank the lead sponsors, in particular, for adding the um, eighth and final whereas and recognizing the work that I've done in that space as a former Assistant District Attorney, uh, working with my former boss, uh, District Attorney Ralph Martin, uh, led efforts in identifying uh, a significant number of um, underreported, arguably, uh, domestic violence crimes, uh, particularly in the LGBTQ, as well as uh, the immigrant community. And we work very closely with uh, Area B2, D4, and E13, specifically uh, as it pertains to uh, the LGBT community, and also with Area A7 in East Boston, with an uptick uh, from the uh, domestic violence in the immigrant community. And what they did was uh, trained uh, assistant district attorneys to be able to spot that while they're in the first session when an arraignment is taking place, as well as training for their victim witness advocates, as well as their trauma response uh, support. And uh, it led to great efforts in terms of being able to reach out to those victims uh, and put, hopefully, them on a path uh, of, of, um, of recovery and, and, most importantly, safety. So thank you and look forward to this hearing. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Michael Flaherty as a co-sponsor as well. Any further discussion on Docket 0816? Would any councillors wish to add their name? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Mejia. Please add the chair, Councillor Wu. And docket 0816 will be referred to the Committee on Public Health. Madam Clerk, would you please read docket 0817? Thank you. 
Docket 0817, Councillor Asabi George offered the following resolution in support of assisted outpatient treatment known as AOT legislation with Bill, House Bill 2121. Thank you. The chair recognizes the at-large counsel from Dorchester, Councillor Asabi George. The floor is yours. Thank you again, Mr. President. This resolution is, is in support of House Bill 2121, which would create an assisted outpatient treatment program for those dealing with severe mental illness. Connecticut, Maryland, and Massachusetts are the only three states without an AOT program. AOT essentially diverts people with severe mental illness out of the criminal justice system and into, into treatment programs where they are able to receive the care they need. After implementing AOT, states with these programs have seen a reduction in incidence and duration of hospitalization, hosp homelessness, arrests, and incarcerations, as well as victimization and violent episodes. The Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use, and Recovery is holding a hearing on Monday to review this bill. I ask for suspension of the rules and passage of this resolution in support of creating this needed program. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion on docket 0817? Would any councillors wish to, oh, excuse me. Chair recognizes the district council from Hyde Park. Council Royal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I have questions uh, that I think might be best addressed by uh, the maker. Uh, this bill uh, is put forward by Republican Matthew Muratore regarding uh, assisted outpatient therapy uh, as a former public defender who dealt with Section 12s and involuntary uh, Section 12s, which for folks who don't know, Section 35s were brought up earlier. Section 12s are when somebody in your family or someone you know is having a mental breakdown or a mental emergency, you can involuntarily get them processed uh, at a hospital, and, and those are heartbreaking moments when you have them. However, this looks like uh, this goes a step further, and I, and I just want clarification as to AOT itself, because I know that Matthew Moratore, who, who's putting it forward, but in terms of AOT itself as, a, as an act of decriminalization of mental health, it, it seems to me that this, what this actually does is it forces involuntary treatment, involuntary taking of medication, and if they refuse to take that medication or to take that treatment that they are then involuntarily held, whether it's at a hospital or somewhere else, is that an accurate understanding of, of that from the chair to the maker? Sure. Thank you, Council Royo. Uh, to answer the query, the chair recognizes the lead sponsor, the district, uh, excuse me, the at-large council from Dorchester, Councilor Sabi George. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you to the Councilor for the question. We look forward to actually understanding that at a deeper level on Monday. I think it's so important to note, though, how incredibly important it is that we have systems in place to care for those that are in um, the greatest need, and happy to uh, speak to that as I offer my public testimony on Monday before this hearing. Thank you. Uh, did that satisfy your question? Uh, chair recognizes the district council from Hyde Park. Yes, basically, uh, just I don't have enough information to vote affirmatively for this, but I, I'm not going to block it from Thanks. being put up for a vote. Okay. Thank you both. Any further discussion on docket 0817? Would any councilors wish? Oh, excuse me. I'm so sorry. The chair recognizes the district council from East Boston. Councilor Edwards, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Council Royo for bringing up uh, some of the points of the organization. But I also know Councilor Sabi George's heart and dedication to mental health issues. So if I may like to note or condition or note my vote, I will support this resolution with the understanding that my support is not if this bill is going to enact as the way Councilor Royo discussed it as an, a means to subvert or to lower due process standards and or to criminalize mental health. So I agree with Councilor Sabi George and if that is the message you're going to take to the State House, that is something I'm supporting you on. But I do want to note that when I go to support this is because I trust her heart, her knowledge and her dedication to this. But yes, bills, while well, they're like sausage and they will be rectified and taken care of. And I just, again, thank you, Council Royo, for highlighting that concern. Thank you. Um, there wasn't really a question there, and we'll I get back to you if, <laughs> unless there's any further discussion on this docket. Seeing none, the chair uh, uh, calls on the lead sponsor, Councilor Saibi George. So I, I appreciate colleagues' questions and, and thoughts and um, possible concerns about this bill. What I'm happy to do is table this or withdraw it, resubmit it next week following the hearing with a, with a more detailed update on the bill as it's presented and share perhaps an update and announcements next week on or through this presentation on what transpired at the hearing on Monday. 
Fair enough. Yeah. I will leave it to the uh, sponsor. If you do not withdraw it, we will refer it to the Committee on Public Health. I don't think there's a need necessarily for a hearing, mm -hmm. but if you feel comfortable in bringing this up to pull from the green sheets next week, if the chair, if everyone seems, that would be my suggestion. That seems like an appropriate next move. Thank okay. you. Okay, fantastic. Any further discussion on docket 0817? Would any councillors wish to add their name to docket 0817? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden. Councillor Flynn, please add the chair's name as well. And docket 0817 will be referred to the Committee on Public Health for probably a likely vote uh, or potential vote at next Wednesday's council meeting for the Green Sheets. Um, moving on, Madam Clerk, would you please read docket 0818. Docket 0818, Councillors Wu and Mejia offer the following resolution, recognizing June as Black Restaurant Month. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The Chair recognizes the at-large council from Roslindale. Councillor Wu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and thank you to Councillor Mejia for partnering on this. This is just to make sure that the City Council is officially uh, getting on record in support of what is already happening out in the community, thanks to the Boston Black Hospitality Coalition. I want to give a special shout out to uh, some leaders. There are many involved, uh, but especially Royal Smith of District 7, Nia Grace from Darrells, and Farouk Sahabdeen. We know that this is a community and a group of job creators, entrepreneurs, community staples who have been devastated throughout the pandemic. And so for every uh, restaurant that we celebrate in Boston, there is a set of community members who are getting food access, who are getting jobs, who are investing in our community. Um, and so we want to stand with the Boston Black Hospitality Coalition, which was formed during the pandemic to address the inequities that are systemic and structural and persist to this day with our racial wealth gap. And this uh, Boston Black Restaurant Month in particular is in June of this year because it marks a century since the massacre of Black Wall Street in Tulsa and a chance for us to reflect on the depth of progress that we still need to see and the perseverance, the resiliency, the contributions of black entrepreneurship, culture and community. So. Um, eager to make sure that we are standing with our community members here and enjoying our, our uh, black-owned restaurants in Boston and lifting up to change the system so that we see much more wealth creation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wu. The Chair recognizes the at-large Councilor from Dorchester. Councilor Mejia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Councilor Wu for co-sponsoring this resolution as the Chair of Small Business and Workforce Development. During COVID, I have realized that there's a lot of work to do um, to support our businesses here. Um, we found out early in the pandemic that one in five restaurants in Massachusetts was shut down as a result of COVID-19. After 15 months of COVID-19 pandemic, it feels like this statistic has been said so many times that is, it, it's, it, it actually has just lost its meaning. But to the restaurant owners and workers across the city of Boston, especially black-owned restaurants who have been borne the brunt of this pandemic, that number is real um, now as it was in March of 2020. Black restaurants across the city are still struggling to reopen with some facing devastating utility bills, back rent, and other operating costs that make opening back up nearly impossible. We need to offer support, not just with our words, but with our dollars. Food is such an important part of the black experience in America. It's not just nourishment for our people, it's celebration and opportunity for gathering and discussion. The first commercially published book written by a black person in the United States was actually a cookbook. It was written by Robert Roberts, a free black Bostonian and a fierce abolitionist. His work goes to show that food is not just nourishment, food is liberation. And that is why we need to support our black restaurants, not just during June, but every day, all day, 200, actually 24-7, 365 days a year. We would not be here if it weren't for the amazing advocates in the Black Boston um, Hospitality Coalition, people like Nia Grace, who have pushed us to do more for our black businesses. Thank you to those advocates and to the people doing the work. I urge you all to vote um, to pass this resolution. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Is there any further discussion on docket 0818? Would any councillors wish to add their name? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Saibi George, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn, 
please add the chair's name as well. And Councillors Wu and Mejia seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0818. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Congratulations. The docket is adopted. Now moving on to late files, I'm informed by the clerk that we have two late file matters. Uh, they are two resolutions sponsored by Councillor Edwards. All those in favor of adding the late file matters into the, to the agenda, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. They are hereby added. Madam Clerk, would you please read the first and last paragraph of the first late file matter into the record? Thank you, Mr. President. Offered by Council Lydia Edwards. In the, in the City Council, resolution in support of House Bill 2201, a petition relative to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeal reviews exceptions to the City's Zoning Code, including variances to height, density, and setback requirements, approval of conditioned zoning uses, and other exceptions to zoning that guide development in Boston. And whereas Legislative action is necessary as the enabling legislation of the ZBA currently does not allow for certain changes as proposed in the executive order and are necessary to ensure public trust in the continued and substantial work of the board. Therefore, be it resolved that the Boston City Council go on record in support of House Bill 2201, a petition relative to the Zoning Board of Appeals to further and sound administrating zoning, administration of zoning and to protect the general welfare of the public and public good, filed on June 23rd, 2021. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The Chair recognizes the District Counsel from East Boston, Councilor Edwards. The floor is yours on the first late file matter. Thank you very much for your patience and indulgence. Uh, five Clar Flaherty, this is late file Lydia. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and I apologize again. Uh, I, I just, um, the reason why this was, I felt necessary that we do this today is because yesterday was the hearing in the State House about our home rule petition. We passed this unanimously and it came from our body. It was part of a compromise of a back and forth to hold the ZBA accountable. I don't know a counselor in here, district or at large, who hasn't had someone scream at them about what the heck just happened at the ZBA. Why did that just happen? They didn't listen to me. As of late, they didn't let me talk. They didn't even hear from me. They said, if I say what someone says in front of me, I can't even speak. Let alone before that, we have the, there seems to be an understanding that they're going to get a variance. And a, a developer can walk up there and say, well, I don't meet the profit margins, so I need to make it bigger. The standards for a variance have nothing to do with your profit or your bottom line. And so last year, in a back and forth with the Walsh administration, we came up with uh, compromise legislation. In part, a home rule petition for legal things that we could not do in the other part, which was an executive order. Things we wanted to do and have to go to the State House. And I'll just say this again, unlike other cities, we have to go to the State House for our zoning reform. We would, be, we would be putting an environmentalist and an urban planner on the ZBA. We have to go to the State House for that. Setting term limits for the, board mem uh, for the board members, requiring members to recuse themselves from projects they've been involved with in the last five years, requiring quarterly reports on variances and conditional use permits so we actually know what's going on in all of our neighborhoods. And also the legislation would require at least one renter and one homeowner uh, that they can overlap with the other required seats to be sitting on the board. I personally uh, testified yesterday at the hearing, and I would love for it to go further. I think that we should also consider removing, that was taken out, but removing real estate interest from the ZBA. That can be put back in. I think we should also seriously consider um, not, uh, lowering the term limits, which we compromised at three to two, three year terms. But most importantly, I know that that body at the State House is gonna look to what this body thinks about a home rule. Yes, we unanimously passed it, but that was a year ago. So I'm hoping you guys support this resolution saying we still stand by what we did. And I'd love to be able to, by the end of this week, send our hopefully unanimously passed resolution up to the State House saying all of us still stand there and also to our, our brothers and sisters in the Boston delegation. That is the goal and I hope you will stand with me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Chair recognizes the at-large counselor from South Boston. Councillor Flaherty, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, was that Lydia late file with a Y? With a Y. <laughs> Very good. So uh, please add my name, uh, Mr. President, and, um, and kudos to uh, our colleague for uh, staying on top of this. Um, 
one of the things that obviously continues to, to, to bother me with the process is that uh, when someone gets a deferral, uh, the proponents are not required to sort of re-notice the direct abutters. And so you have sort of this little cat and mouse game of uh, seeing uh, one uh, constant uh, Flanagan's district where it's a, you see it with multiple deferrals and then they wait for people to be kind of caught off guard, maybe away for the summer, et cetera. And then the next thing you know, it's, it seems like it's fast tracked and folks feel that the cake is baked and the fix is in. It just, it has a bad sort of a, a smell and taste and, and tone to it. So uh, I would love for, for uh, that to be sort of part of this where uh, if you're, uh, before the Zoning Board of Appeals and your matter gets either withdrawn or deferred, uh, that you, as the proponent, you have a responsibility working with neighborhood services and inspectional services to re-notice uh, the direct about is in those interested parties so that uh, no one's caught off guard and no one thinks there's anything nefarious happening. So uh, that uh, said, obviously uh, making sure that uh, we're um, paying close attention to the activities up there and making sure that whether the requirements that we're requiring for their, uh, for the uh, for the process in terms of the individual members and the skill set that they bring to bear, recognizing that it's you know it's a sort of a volunteer process. We're asking a lot of them. Uh, they're giving up uh, time uh, to participate in the process. Uh, clearly, we need uh, that acumen, and particularly also from the community seat perspective. We want to hear from neighbors, but uh, this is something that uh, we. Uh, do regularly uh, every Tuesday uh, district and at-large councils are up there and or our staffs uh, advocating uh, either for or um, you know uh, working with uh, director about as against and so uh, we clearly have a role to play here and we have a front row seat to it uh, we're responsive to our constituents and our neighborhoods and so hopefully uh, our, our colleagues up in Beacon Hill will listen loud and clear to our colleagues uh, petition and make sure that we're putting the best possible um, uh, product uh, with respect to the Zoning Board of Appeals online and, uh, and available for the, uh, for the public. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Michael Flaherty as a co-sponsor. The Chair recognizes the District Councillor from Dorchester. Councillor Baker, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me first sign on and, and I also want to just throw something out there. Maybe if, if we made board members actual city workers, whether they're part-time or full-time, if we would allow them to spend more time with the projects that are in front of them. I, I, I for the life of me, try and figure out how someone sitting on a board can take a plans for a 50-story or, or even, even just a small addition. How, how in-depth can you get into those and how much of the understanding is there? So that's something that I think we should be talking about is should those people be actually full-time employees so they get to spend more time with the plans and with it, well, how the process went. Um, so just a thought, and again, sign my name on. Thank you and thank the, the maker for bringing this up again. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Please add Councillor Baker as a co-sponsor. The chair recognizes the district councilor from South Boston. Councillor Flynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, please sign my name and just want to thank the uh, maker for her work on this important issue. Um, just following up on Councilor Flaherty's comments, also as part of the neighborhood process, the district city councilors, um, you know, deal with this issue frequently, but the amount of deferrals that a project can have sometimes can be seven or can be eight, and we're constantly mobilizing residents to come to City Hall or have their voices heard at City Hall. And after the third or fourth time, the, the residents are frustrated in the process and kind of give up hope. And then that's when something actually gets approved. So it's incumbent upon us as district councilors and at-large councilors to follow this closely, but there has to be a better system on deferrals than just deferring because you can't win the project on that day. And so maybe you'll try a month later to see if you can win it a month later. But it's demoralizing to the residents that have to keep coming back. Um, you know, sometimes they have to jump on the bus at Ellen Broadway, they have to take the bus to Broadway Station. They have to get off at Broadway Station, they have to go to Park Street to spend an hour at City Hall to find out it's deferred, then they have to go back. They have to take the train back and then take the bus back. So my point is residents are frustrated about it and um, they want some transparency in how this process works. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Ed Flynn as a co-sponsor. Any further discussion on this? Seeing no takers. Would any councillors wish to add their name? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Sivey George, Councillor Mejia. Please add the chair, Councillor Wu as well. And uh, the author, Councillor Edwards, seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of the first late file resolution, which of course is the resolution in support of H2201, petition relative to the Zoning Board of Appeals. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The resolution is adopted. Congratulations, Councillor Edwards. Um, Madam Clerk, we're now moving on to the second late file matter. Uh, would you please read the first and last clause uh, into the record? Thank you, Mr. President. Offered by Council Lydia Edwards and the City Council, resolution in support of House Bill 3863, an act relative to reprecincting. Whereas in March 2021, Massachusetts Representative Michael J. Moran, House Chair of the Special Joint Committee on Redistricting, filed House Bill 820, an act relative to reprecincting. In June 2021, H820 was reported out favorably in the House Committee on Ways and Means and now lives in a new draft in House Bill 3863 with Senate Ways and Means. Whereas Common Cause, ACLU, and other voting right groups in the Drawing Democracy Coalition support House Bill 3863 because using updated census data to craft state and federal districts rather than already, already drawn local precincts will allow for more equal political boundaries that keep ethnic and racial communities together. And therefore, be it resolved that the Boston City Council go on record in support of House Bill 3863, an act relative to reprecincting, because adjusting the timeline for reprecincting is a prudent and responsive act of governance in response to COVID-19 pandemic that we will only apply to the current decennial redistricting process. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The Chair recognizes the District Council from East Boston. Councilor Edwards, the floor is yours. Thank you. And this is another bill um, pending at the State House that is moving actually quite favorably. And it's really trying to make sure that our process for redistricting doesn't get ahead or doesn't ignore the, the practical realities of our ability to collect data and actually reflect districts that are diverse and inclusive, which we do have a lot of. It's also to make sure that we have representatives from those diverse, uh, inclusive uh, districts. So this is essentially saying our traditional dread deadline, which has already been passed of June 15th, would have said at this point, draw your lines on the, on the redistricting path. Due to COVID and due to the way that our process has been wholly delayed, this is asking for an extended deadline to December 15th to allow for additional data to come in from the census to make sure we meet the deadline, but also are inclusive. So we're changing the deadline. I understand that the Secretary of State either opposes this or has some questions about this, but that so far is the only real opposition I have heard about this. Again, there are a lot of friends and colleagues who supported our inclusive democracy and local levels, uh, local efforts here, who are also supportive of this, as mentioned in the um, resolution, ACLU, uh, Common Cause, and Drawing Democracy Coalition, which includes, I, I don't even have a list of how many people around the state. So again, this would, uh, and it's also finite. It is not for forever change. This is really just trying to get to a specific time and it would only apply to the current decennial de redistricting process. So I think this is a compromise and an attempt to try and get people in the room to draw the lines in the most reflective way. So I hope we'll go online and support this moving bill. Thank you. Online, did I say online? Go online and support <laughs> <laughs> on record. On record. <laughs> Both on record and online. Thank you, uh, Councillor Edwards. Chair recognizes the District Council from Hyde Park. Councillor Arroyo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as a chair of redistricting, I, I support this. Uh, I, we've been dealing with the budget. Some folks here may have noticed today. Uh, but July, September, October, November, this is really the next big thing we're going to be dealing with is redistricting and doing that equitably. And I think there's folks in this room, I think everybody in this room has had some significant changes to their neighborhoods and their precincts since 2009, 2010. I know certainly the population explosion in South Boston is not reflected in these most recent uh, precincts and the ways in which we do things. 
um, and certainly not the diversity in the ways in which the city has changed. And so waiting for those numbers, making sure that we have the dates to actually use the real data, the real numbers that we have, uh, is not only appropriate, but because this is a process that takes 10 years before we get to do it again, we, it's really important we get it right the first time. Uh, and without those, those numbers, I don't think we're doing uh, an adequate job of that. So I support this, I support the bill, uh, and I look forward to engaging with everybody here moving forward until like, July, August, September, October about what redistricting looks like in the city of Boston. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Arroyo. Would you like your name added? Yes, please. Thank you. Madam Clerk, please add Councilor Ricardo Arroyo as a co-sponsor. The chair recognizes the district council from Beacon Hill. Councilor Bach, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. Please add my name. Um, I'd like to go on, on record in support. I, um, you know, ordinarily, the cities and towns present the precincts first, um, and but ordinarily, the rest of the cities and towns have to actually draw those to be equal. Um, Boston has an 80, maybe going on 90 year exemption from that, which has resulted in a situation where, um, you know, as, as has been covered in the press lately, but I know which many of us have dealt with firsthand for a long time, that you can have a precinct like the one in Councillor Baker's with one voter, and then you can have precincts. Um, I'll let Councillor Flynn speak to them. He has probably the most intensive here, but precincts where really there just isn't uh, enough um, facilities for the number of people who are trying to vote. And it's heartbreaking when you see somebody leave a line in a presidential election. I mean, it's just wrong. Um, and what I'm encouraged by in this case is that actually the fact that we're de pushing the deadline for the precincts gives us, Boston, a chance to actually seriously talk about re-precincting. Um, because generally what's happened is we hit this deadline that would be coming and we just say, oh yeah, leave all the precincts the same because we don't have to change them, unlike everybody else. And it's understandable, you know, we have long-term community um, familiarity with certain polling places. People are used to things like, and you want, you know, you want that, to, that familiarity to endure as much as you can. Um, but I think we've gotten to the point where it is way too lopsided. Um, I, to Councillor Arroyo's point, spent some time in May with spreadsheets trying to think about which precincts you have to change to make it more fair before realizing that I couldn't do that during budget. Um, but I do think that like it's, we've been talking about it for a long time and other councillors on this body have led on it. Um, when I was the chair of the Ward 5 Democrats before this role, um, we repeatedly pushed in Ward 5 for reform on this because Ward 5 Precinct 1 is one of the largest ones in the city and repeatedly sees lines. So I'm in, I'm in favor of this and I think it gives us the opportunity to solve some problems in our own house um, in the year ahead. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Chair recognizes the district, oh, excuse me, Councillor Bach, did you want your name added? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Bach. Chair recognizes the district council from South Boston. Councillor Flynn, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Please, please add my name. Um, Mr. President, I just wanted to highlight the, the important role of re-precincting, redistricting, but even last year and the year before, the important work so many residents did and our colleagues did on the census. That was a critical part of it. And during this pandemic, a lot of civic organizations, um, neighborhood organizations, human rights organizations, such as Chinese Progressive Association or the Castle Square Tenants Organization, they did a lot, a lot of tremendous work across the city in actually having people um, counted. So I want to highlight the incredible work of so many people in organizations throughout the city of Boston and uh, the May Mayor Walsh's team as well and my colleagues in government. But um, that was an important part of the re-precincting um, that we're, we're going to be doing now. But hats off to um, all the community activists across the city. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Madam Clerk, please add Councillor mm -hmm. Ed Flynn. The Chair recognizes the District Council from Dorchester. Councillor Baker, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Madam, for putting this forth. Um, Re-precincting is a heavy, heavy lift, and I don't know if we are going to be able to get it all done in time to have the lines in September and November shorter than what, you know, so what my question is maybe here, does this discussion include sub-precincting sub where we can just split precincts and allow two separate voting locations? It's a little bit more simple where we could talk to it this year and, and, and have the lines be less in sub... Sorry to throw a wrench in this works here, Mr. Mr. Chair, but just a thought. I know we always get back to re-precincting, sub-precincting, um, but I do want to sign on to this and, and support this. 
Thank you. It uh, can be answered, doesn't need to be answered, but it will, we will be discussing it in the next couple of months. Absolutely, fair point. Uh, Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Baker. Did the author wish to react to that? Sure. The chair recognizes Councillor Lydia Edwards. Brief response, it doesn't go that granular. As you recall, we had a, a good uh, conversation with Sabino Palante and Anaida Tavares specifically about the sub uh, precincts and what they were looking at and that was at the city level yeah. but that follows this conversation and that conversation can really only happen as we're all saying till we get the real data so. thank you fair point thank you any further discussion on this second lay file matter seeing none would any counselors who haven't already added their name wish to do so madam clerk please add councillor Braden councillor Campbell councillor Saibi George councillor Mejia councillor Wu please add the chair's name as well Excuse me, I'm uh, sorry. The chair recognizes the at-large counsel from South Boston, Councillor Flaherty. Please add my name. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Michael Flaherty as well. Um, so that is everybody. And the uh, author, Councillor Edwards, seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of the second late file matter, which is the resolution in support of H3863, an act relative to redistricting. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The second light file matter has been adopted. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Congratulations. Anybody wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. Seeing no takers, thankfully, we are now moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, I've been informed by the clerk that there are zero additions to the consent agenda. Well done. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The consent agenda has been adopted. Are there any announcements? The chair <laughs> recognizes the at-large counsel from Dorchester, Councillor Anissa Saibi George. The floor is yours for a brief announcement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, President, very much for uh, two brief announcements. I wanted to take a quick moment to let you all know that through that consent agenda, we filed a resolution recognizing Friday as the 10th annual World Vitiligo Awareness Day. Uh, this day seeks to raise awareness of this autoimmune disorder that imp impacts approximately 70 million people around the world, including members of my own family. While this only, uh, the only physical symptom of vitiligo is loss of skin pigmentation, the emotional and psychological impact is great due to others' lack of awareness and prejudice. In Boston, we are very lucky to have vitiligo care clinics at the Brigham, at UMass Medical School, and at Tufts as well as a very engaged local community. I hope that this World Vitiligo Day continues to raise awareness of the condition and to celebrate those who live with this autoimmune disorder. I also want to note that on December 31st, Governor Baker signed into law the Massachusetts Police Reform Bill. This bill was far-reaching, had far-reaching refer reforms that go into effect next week. This has caused some un uncertainty with specialized police officers, like our school police officers, BHA housing officers, constables, private security, environmental police officers, and more. Statewide, there are specific, about 2,500 specialty police officers and approximately 400 in the city of Boston. While many of these reforms are long overdue, the officers themselves need clarity about the next steps for compliance. I implore all the agencies and organizations involved to ensure that their employees have all the information they need to maintain employment, perform their jo jobs, and move forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councillor Saibi George. The chair recognizes the District Council from East Boston. Councillor Edwards, the floor is yours. I will be brief uh, because I, I don't want to uh, get emotional. Um, my, one of my closest friends, uh, one of the most loyal people I've met, and one of the hardest working people I know is growing immensely. And uh, my dear friend and chief of staff is going to be moving on. You all know Gabriella or Gigi, and uh, she has been here since day one. It's fun to have my day one like my mom here with my day one like my chief of staff who literally called me on the day that um, Salamatina announced he was no longer running for re-election in April 2017 and said, if you're thinking about it, uh, I'll be with you. And that's, that's how the campaign started. I had no money, we had no team. Um, and it was a year, to, almost a year to the day to when I had lost my first run as a, for the Senate seat. She came on and what we did together in the hot sun for, for many weeks until we finally caught some more volunteers and got together 
Every single one of you know what it feels like to have somebody with you when no one is there. Every single one of us has been in the hot sun, working so hard, and to have her be there from day one, and then to grow into the chief of staff that I have, my dear friend. Um, I literally remember I had one job, and that was to get from that back door to here on one of the first meeting days. And somehow I messed that up <laughs> by getting uh, coffee all over my shirt. And so, like the amazing person she is, she gave me the shirt off her back so I could come be presented here. I am, I have to make this announcement because I just, you have been there, Gabriella, through my divorce, through losing my partner, and you were there even when your mother was in a coma due to COVID. And it's, I love you so much. I love you enough to let you go because I want you to be more than I can ever think of. And it was the hardest phone call to have when the aquarium called and said, we'd like a reference for her. <laughs> and I said, you're not gonna pay her enough. So, this, and so we began to negotiate how much more they're gonna have to pay her in order for me to feel comfortable. Oh yeah, that's what I, when I ride or die for somebody, I was like, if you're taking her, you're taking her for no less than, and you're gonna give her this, and you better, you better recognize the value you have in her, and you better treat her right, and you better give her the team to support her and for her to flourish. And, 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 and I hate penguins, and all of those things, because she's going to the aquarium. Penguins didn't do anything to me, but, um, I look forward now for being your friend. We were always friends, but now it's gonna be at a different level. And I just wanted to say, because you all know what it's like when you have that staff person who can ride, who's a ride or die. So I'm hoping you all will um, join me in a round of applause for my ride or die and thank her and congratulate her for her new life. Beautiful words, thank you, and congratulations, Gigi. We will miss you here, but I hope to be able to campaign for you someday in the not too distant <laughs> future. Any further announcements? Seeing, hearing none. We're now moving on to memorials. Um, today we will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Councillors Flynn, Flaherty and Baker, Joseph Fisher. For Councillors Asaibi George and Baker, Charles Chuck O'Donnell. A moment of silence, please. Chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of the aforementioned individuals. We are scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber next Wednesday, June 30th at 12 noon. All in favor of adjournment, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Council is hereby adjourned.